Good evening, everyone. Um, it's 6 p.m. Um, we're going to give uh, our committee members a little more time to uh, join in. Um, and uh, hopefully, we're going to be able to start uh, promptly. Hi, Layla. Uh, I assume you were told that I'll be standing in for Luke, um, helping manage the webinar for this. And EJ. Can you hear me? Yes, I can okay. hear you. Okay, great. Great. Uh, EJ, you there? Yes. Can you okay. hear me? I can. Thanks. Um, so I have a question. It looks like in the chat, I'm seeing that um, one of the attendees is a member of the public um, that is blind using a talking computer. Um, so I assume if they want to ask a question during that portion of the meeting, um, I don't know if it's possible to raise a hand. Could we just ask them to indicate in the chat if they have a question and we can call on them that way? Hey, Joseph, while they're doing that, you might want to take a look at the list of attendees. It looks like a lot of committee members are stuck as attendees and should be upgraded to panelists. Okay, sure. Maybe, maybe they can help you. If you're a, a committee member and you're an attendee need to be upgraded to be a panelist, please click raise hand. Maybe that'll help you. All right, we're gonna be able to uh, get started. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Leila Lopezico. I'm the chair of the Land Use, Housing and Zoning Committee of Manhattan Community Board 5. Uh, I am joined uh, by uh, E.J. Kalafarski, who is the chair of the uh, Transportation and Environment Committee of uh, CB5. Uh, a few words about uh, what is in front of us tonight and how the meeting is uh, going to run. So first of all, thank you so much to uh, all the members, panelists, and attendees uh, who are uh, joining us tonight. 
Uh, tonight we're going to be discussing uh, the uh, draft scope of work uh, related to uh, the Empire Station Complex project um, that was uh, published by uh, the governor of the state of New York on uh, July uh, 1st of uh, 2020. Um, as you know, um, the uh, governor is uh, proposing a, a big land, land use um, action. Um, so I'm actually going to ask you not to share any screen at this time. Um, okay, we, we, um, I'm going to ask our uh, moderator, uh, Joseph, can you actually um, remove the um, screen sharing, please? Sure, I will uh, do that right now. Sorry. Joseph, you're muted. Can you hear me now, Layla? Um, okay, I, I would like, before I continue Sorry, um, any now? further, I would like to get back to um, our um, Zoom page with attendees. Okay, great, thank you. Um, okay, so, <laughs> Um, no screen sharing for the moment, thank you. Um, we are uh, reviewing the, uh, the draft scope of work for uh, the redevelopment of uh, the Penn Station area that was uh, introduced by uh, the governor at the beginning of the month. Um, there will be a hearing held uh, by uh, the uh, Empire, State, uh, Empire Development Corporation, which is the entity um, you know, from the state of New York that um, has uh, jurisdiction over this, uh, this development. Uh, and there's going to be a hearing uh, on the scoping of this proposal on uh, July 20th. So Community Board 5 needs to um, establish and develop a position on uh, you know, what we believe the scope uh, should be, uh, whether it is appropriate or uh, should be revised. And this is the purpose of uh, the meeting tonight. So um, a few words about what exactly that means. Um, the scoping phase is not a matter of endorsing or rejecting the proposal. It is really in the preliminary phase, a matter of determining what should be within the scope, what is within the uh, parameters that we want uh, in, uh, you know, discussed and reviewed and analyzed uh, during the, uh, the, the review process. So um, I'm gonna ask all members and attendees to actually refrain from commenting globally on you know position on this proposal i'm sure we have strong feelings um but now is not the time to actually uh you know spell out those uh those feelings or those concerns really we're going to stick to uh discussing the scope of uh this this proposal um, as uh, members of uh, both committees, what we are going to do tonight is, uh, you know, come up with a set of recommendations. Um, they will be in the form of a resolution because we need them to be uh, actionable so that we can present them to, um, to this hearing on the, uh, the 20th. And um, so we will take a vote. So I'm asking you to uh, actually stay until the end of this meeting so that we can take a vote. And um, this will become our official, uh, our official position on the scope of work. So uh, you, I, as uh, members of the committee, you have received an email earlier this morning that spells out uh, you know, the sort of uh, buckets, uh, you know, areas that uh, we're going to be uh, discussing so that we don't get uh, too scattered in uh, reviewing this, uh, th this document. Um, so the way we're going to operate is that, you know, th there is no presentation, uh, you know, the, uh, um, uh, the, the, the entity, the, uh, you know, the, the sponsor agency is not going to give us a presentation tonight. Uh, we will have this opportunity. They will come to us to give a, a full presentation at a later time. Um, but um, I'm going to make the assumption that you have all read the, uh, the scoping document. Uh, it was circulated multiple times. And uh, hopefully you have some thoughts on uh, what should be uh, revised, included, um, or you know, amended in, uh, in this document. 
I'm going to lead the sort of, you know, structural uh, process of the meeting. EJ is going to lead the, uh, the discussion on uh, transportation and transit centric issues. And um, towards the end, EJ and I will, uh, you know, join forces to uh, bring all of that into uh, a uh, concise and comprehensive uh, set of recommendations. So, um, for good housekeeping, just to make sure uh, everybody understands, um, Joseph Fruer uh, is with us tonight as uh, our uh, moderator. So uh, Luke is actually uh, away and was not able to uh, to be with us. So uh, Joseph has uh, kindly agreed to uh, to join us. Um, the process is very similar to the way we run other committee meetings and as well as the full board meeting. Please raise your hands, uh, unmute your, uh, mute yourselves at all times and we, uh, when you are recognized to speak. Um, you can use the um, uh, raise hand uh, button um, that uh, Joseph would be able to tell you where to find it. I'm not sure that I have the, uh, the same uh, view as, um, as you have on, on your computers. Um, and wait to be recognized uh, before you speak. We will um, slice off the, uh, uh, the conversation in questions and comments, but mostly you know, we're gonna make comments because um, you know, we don't have a, an applicant in the room to actually answer any uh, specific questions. And um, so with all of that said, I think that it's, um, fair given uh, you know, the, the uh, transit-centric uh, nature of this proposal uh, to pass it on to EJ, who is uh, going to lead the, uh, the conversation on uh, transportation and transit. EJ. I'm sorry, just to interrupt, it looks like we have a raised hand from Clayton. I don't know if uh, just pointing that out. Yeah, thanks, so Leila. Thank I just wanted to ask procedurally if you could briefly explain to all of us and to members of the public who are interested, if this is circumventing ULERP, what it is that the process, uh, what, what the formal mechanism is for this scope, you know, what the nature is of the hearing on the 20th. Uh, yeah, so um, should I make the assumption that everybody is familiar with the ULERP process? Um, Let's make this assumption. We can, we can revisit that assumption if, if need be. Um, but in essence, um, given that it is a state-sponsored uh, land use action, it is actually circumventing the ULR process. With the ULR process, um, there would be a number of very specific uh, set of, uh, you know, uh, it, elected officials uh, and uh, you know, elected bodies that would review the, uh, the, the proposal, including uh, the community board, uh, the board president, um, the um, uh, city planning commission, as well as the city council. And the city council would have a uh, final say with uh, their, their vote on um, endorsing and supporting the, uh, the, the, the project. In that particular case, um, given that it is a state-sponsored uh, uh, project, it is uh, very different. Um, the, uh, the final approval lies in the hands of, I'm going to tell you that, I have that in my notes. Um, so it is actually the uh, PACB. Uh, which is a, a board um, that is uh, appointed by the, uh, by the governor. So it's basically, you know, the, this board that is appointed by, the, by the governor that will have final say on approving the proposal by the governor. Um, there's going to be a number of uh, hearings, but obviously the, uh, the, the city uh, elected officials and uh, agencies uh, will not have the role that they would have in uh, ULERP. Uh, in particular, um, there is actually no formal um, referral period to the community board. We'll have a chance to weigh in, but it's not formal and codified uh, the way it is for ULERP. And obviously there will be no vote by uh, the city council. So th those are the major differences. Now, in terms of what's in front of us tonight, it is actually very similar. Uh, whether it is for ULERP or through this process, the scoping session is pretty much the same. You basically, you know, you read 
what it is that uh, this project is going to do to the environment and you determine if you believe that it encompasses all the areas that um, this project is getting, going to have an impact on. To, to give you a sort of analogy, uh, just imagine that you know it is a small project, it is a, a road from a small village to a larger town and the road is going to go through a forest. And the question would be, you know, what is going to be the impact to the forest, to the trees, to the animals, to the water, um, to, you know, is, is that going to have any visual impact? This is a much bigger magnitude. And, but the questions that we have to ask ourselves are the same. What is this project going to have as an impact on our environment? And, um, you know, the, the questions basically, you know, rise from, you know, obviously transit and trans transportation, but, uh, you know, also, uh, as, as I have uh, spelled out in the email this morning, um, you know, uh, socioeconomic conditions, uh, population displacement, business displacement, uh, urban design, uh, historic resources, um, you know, all those things. So basically, those are the questions tonight that we need to uh, address and we need to figure out how we want to structure that to tell the sponsoring body um, what we want in the scope. D does that address? Does that address yes, it's very helpful, thanks. Thank you. Um, so EJ, if you, if you wanna um, maybe start the conversation on uh, the uh, impacts to uh, transit and infrastructure on this particular project, and then we can uh, open up to uh, members of the committee for uh, questions and comments. Absolutely. And um, before I get uh, before I get started into some of the details, I'll um, I'll just say that obviously uh, we only received the scoping document ten days ago, so we're working we're working of course off of um, uh, limited time uh, so that we can put together our testimony as a board over the next seven days after this conversation to get it written up for submission next Monday. Um, the other thing that I will re-emphasize is exactly what Layla said. This discussion tonight is about determining the parameters of the scope. The discussion tonight is not going to be what we think a perfect train station looks like or what all of its capabilities should be or how we think this project should be executed, but the parameters for how that will be assessed and how its effects will be assessed. So specifics of what we'll be talking about tonight is the geographic area of the study area. The, if you look at the, the scoping document that I provided the link for in the chat, um, you'll see that there are 23 tasks already defined in that document, um, which are just general broad topics in terms of what they will look at during the environmental impact study process, which would be the, the next step. So what we want to make sure we're covering tonight is whether or not the parameters are appropriate for uh, that they will study everything that it would be appropriate to study. So I wanted to give that framing before I actually dig into um, some, of the, uh, some of the maps and topics that would be related to actual transit needs. Um, just to recap what uh, most know so far, uh, Penn Station is the uh, largest transit hub in the Western Hemisphere. Um, when there's not a pandemic going on, it deals with 650,000 commuters a day. Uh, three uh, uh, train services uh, serve the station uh, in independent concourses, New Jersey Transit, Amtrak, and the Long Island Railroad. Um, Penn Station used to be a very big grand train station on par with Grand Central um, before Madison Square Garden was built on top of the site, uh, literally on top of the tracks as it is today in 1960, in the, the mid-60s. Um, so obviously a lot of its, a lot of the capabilities, this redevelopment is intended to pay for what is called the, the, Penn, the Penn Complex Master Plan. Now the Master Plan has several elements that we 
that have been discussed and advocated for for several years and which the governor has talked about in various presentations but um, the master plan that this larger neighborhood redevelopment is intended to pay for is not is not set yet um, so in a sense we don't know exactly what this is getting us or what will be developed and what the new features and capacities of Penn Station are intended to be. So we should make sure that this scoping document is is studying broadly enough to keep those options as open as possible. The positioning of Madison Square Garden, where it is right now, directly over the uh, the tracks that serve Amtrak and, and the Long Island Railroad and New Jersey Transit, um, impacts the capabilities of what can be done to continue to increase and improve the capacity, the transit capacity of Penn Station. Um, one, of the one of the probable elements of the master plan is intended to be this extension uh, called Penn South. And I'll refer probably frequently to um, the map that you see on the uh, page three of the scoping document that outlines the, uh, the project area in a red dotted line. Um, what you see on the block south of Penn Station there, which the map calls Site 2, is where this new Penn, Penn South expansion would, would take place. The, the governor's intention is to seize that block via eminent domain, raise it, extend the train station and new tracks underground uh, throughout that block. As we assess this, we're also comparing to um, a previous version of this proposal that uh, the governor provided in January. You'll see on this map that there are other sites, including the site one and site three to the east and west of that site two block. Those were not included in the earlier presentation, but um, it does seem clear that those being in scope would probably very much be required from a practical standpoint for any new tracks to be installed on that site two block. There would need to be runway on either side for the simple practical usage of those tracks as, as um, new transit capacity for the station. So um, we suspect that's very much why site one and site three are included here and why there are new additions um, on, on top of what the governor outlined maybe six months ago. The current location of Madison Square Garden sitting on top of the current tracks severely limits any capacity expansion that could be done um, with those with those existing tracks. New tracks will probably be wider, bigger, new grade, much better than what than, than tracks were, that were built in 1910 like we have now. But however, whatever gets added through Penn South, the current tracks would not be able to be upgraded significantly as long as Madison Square Garden sits directly on top of them. There are additional pylons and support structure that come right down through the train station, propping up the, uh, the uh, arena that's literally on top of it. Um, some estimates suggest that even if you did a, a, a dramatic refurbishment of the existing tracks around those pylons, you could still potentially only add 15% or so capacity. Um, it would be very much infeasible to redo the tracks in a way that um, widens widens the tracks for uh, for different grades of uh, newer train vehicles um, to widen the platforms to make them safer than the very narrow platforms that you kind of weave your way through when you're in when you're down in the tracks of Penn Station now and to enable um, what has been called for by many advocacy groups for many years which would be through running. Very quickly in a nutshell, through uh, trains coming in from Jersey, like New, New Jersey Transit, come all the way into Penn Station and then have to stop and leave back the direction that they came in because New Jersey trains only, co only 
come in from New Jersey and then go back that way. And very often they're coming in full of people and they're leaving empty um, because in rush hour hours, people are headed all in one direction, et cetera. Similarly, Long Island Railroad trains come in from Long Island, load or unload, and then leave back in the same direction. Through running would enable much higher capacity and much better efficiency by say allowing those train systems to work together so that one train comes in from one side, unloads its New Jersey passengers, loads up with Long Island passengers, and then continues on in the same direction. Um, that's a dramatic simplification, but that's the kind of improvement that by being able to actually reconfigure the tracks uh, would dramatically improve the transit capacity of the station. Um, so the context of what the scope makes possible for the garden is going to be very important in terms of considering the capacity and future improvement that is open to not just the aesthetics of being inside Penn Station, but also actually continuing to increase the capacity of Penn Station, which of course, I said 650,000 commuters a day, it's already supporting three times uh, the capacity that it was even built for in the 60s. So with that in mind, I draw your attention to what the map calls site six. Uh, there have been in, in you know, various news outlets over the years, many different uh, speculations about what kind of redevelopment Penn Station could see in the future. Again, we don't know yet what the master plan will call for, but we wanna make sure that the scope that we end up with as part of this scoping document and then the environmental impact study leaves as many options open as possible. One proposal that came up, I think very recently in, in a Gothamist article and via some other advocates was uh, whether or not these two blocks just to the north and east of Madison Square Garden, what on here is called site six, site seven, and site eight could be redeveloped as a, um, not just redeveloped here as is being proposed for new towers or new office space or um, whatever is kind of vaguely alluded to in this document so far, but also for a potential new location for the garden. Um, that is leaving the, as many of those options open as possible is one reason why it's somewhat not suspicious, but detrimental for um, that whole block that's considered site six on this map to not to be included. And it was in fact outlined fully by the governor's last presentation in January. So it would seem that there's a very strong argument for saying that at bare minimum, it's kind of stupid to only include half of a block in your environmental assessment, since the other half of the block is going to be inextricably connected to whatever the effects of redevelopment are going to be. That full block was included the last time the governor talked about this in January. So it's already part of that conversation. And that a lot of the proposed improvements that Penn Station would, would, would truly benefit from, not just aesthetically and having a train station, you know, with a ceiling higher than eight feet going forward, but to actually improve its transit capacity and, um, uh, and future development, uh, creating capacity to move the garden somewhere down the road if the political will and the financing appears for it. Um, would be a very important part of the scoping document. So I think there's a very strong argument for that entire block to be included as it was uh, in, the, in the presentation back in January. Just real quickly in the realm of local transit, uh, we know that they've created a busway on 14th Street. They're talking about another one on Fifth Avenue. Next up, for, for DOT's attentions are probably street, other crosstown streets like 42nd Street, like 23rd Street, like 34th Street. We should make the argument that 34th Street should be assessed as part, you know, it's, it's right there. It's going to be affected by the development here. It should, it should be part of this discussion as well. Um, obviously, some of the project area 
abuts 34th Street, contains half of 34th Street. Um, there, there could be an argument that that the redevelopment on the actual Macy's block and going across 34th Street could be part of the um, uh, part of the discussion as well. Um, so that in sorry to go on for a little bit, but that in a nutshell are kind of all the interconnected implications of. Um, why this, why some of these uh, project areas seem to be defined the way they are on this map and why I think there's a very, very strong argument that um, extending the project area to contain the rest of that block that contains site six is probably something we want to push for very strongly because it was part of the conversation already and because not doing so I think severely limits our understanding of what can be done and severely limits the possibilities of uh, of the types of transit improvements that are going to be possible. Okay, and with great. that. Uh, thank, thank you so much, EJ, for very uh, comprehensive uh, uh, underscoring of uh, so, some of the issues. I know it's, it's dense and complex, uh, but uh, those are really very, very critical. Um, so we're going to stay on the uh, topic of uh, transit and transportation and uh, let's open up the floor to uh, members of the committee for, um, you know, what we're going to actually make questions and comments, uh, given that we don't have a, a presenter, it would be a little artificial. Uh, so uh, please use the uh, raise hand uh, button and uh, go ahead and shoot your comments or questions. Do we have any questions or uh, comments by uh, members of the committees on this particular topic? Um, okay, let's go with uh, Mike Greeley. Mike, go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right. Uh, shall we include the uh, the subway stations on 8th Avenue, 7th Avenue, and 6th Avenue uh, in the transit. Um, I don't know if that would be considered part of the Penn Complex master plan or not, but there should be something from the MTA about how they want to improve those stations included in, in, the, uh, in the plan. Yeah. I, I agree, EJ, what, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think it's, uh, I think it's a valid point? Yeah, and I believe that they are um, uh, included in the scope um, significantly uh, already. If you, go to, if you go to page 14 of the scope, um, you can see, and they do seem to conflate pen, uh, new Penn Station entrances and relocated subway stairs. Uh, certainly the, the geographic areas of all the subway entrances um, uh, seem to be inside of the project area and there are various proposed new Penn Station entrances as well as uh, relocated subway entrances. Um, the, the, the plan itself, you know, how many, how, what the actual configuration of these entrances ends up looking like, um, you know, is, is part of the part of the master plan that we have not we have not seen yet, um, but uh, certainly I totally agree that that the implications on the subway uh, should should be part of the scope. And if we if we suspect that this is that th this map and and these sites as identified are not um, inclusive of that, then Mike, we certainly should propose improvements. Um, I, the the master plan does not at this point seem to be creating any new subway lines or subway capacity or, or plan to affect local subway transit in any sort of specific way. But certainly the entrances and the capacity should be part of that discussion. Okay. Uh, so yeah, just, just to be on the safe side, uh, we will add it as a recommendation so that, you know, we clearly tell the, uh, um, the, the, the sponsor uh, entity of this, uh, of this project uh, that, you know, they, it, it should be assessed in the uh, environmental uh, review process. Uh, Mike, uh, go ahead. Do you have other uh, comments that you want to share? And, yeah, and uh, are the, the pedestrian uh, part of the transit or is that a different aspect? 
uh, sidewalks. Uh, and sidewalk improvements and uh, pedestrian flow uh, is going to fall in the um, urban design historic resource okay. and uh, All right. it's going to make our uh, impact. Um, uh, Clayton, you have a question or comment. Go ahead. Yeah, so you tell me how this is relevant. I, the, the whole thing about scope can be so baffling because you have to be, we have to be so careful to make sure things are included because if it's not, we are screwed after the fact. My number one red flag is about Madison Square Garden, as you both have alluded to. Community Board 5 in, I think it was February of 2013, passed a unanimous resolution to recommend not granting a permit in perpetuity for the garden to operate. In response to that, city council agreed with us and they got a 10 year permit. Can you help me understand just because the block is in scope, what further might we have to do to explicitly call for the consideration of relocating Madison Square Garden to meaningfully improve Penn Station? That's my main question. Yeah, uh, so I think that this uh, is so significant, so important that we, you know, gave it its own, uh, its own uh, bucket. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it, it, I think it's fair to, uh, to jump onto it. Um, uh, so currently, although it falls within the parameter, you know, the, the perimeter of uh, the, the, the district that is, uh, you know, being proposed for the, uh, the land use action, it is actually not part of the action. The same way as EJ uh, explained, the transit below grade transportation uh, improvements are not part of this project. Um, so if it is not part of the project, then it cannot be part of the scope, right? And if it's not part of the scope, it's not going to be evaluated. And if it's not evaluated, then it cannot be commented on and it cannot be acted on. So it is absolutely essential and crucial as you're underscoring it, Clayton, that we do ask that it is included in the scope and that that becomes a part of the proposal. Um, so I, I think it's, uh, you know, it, it is very, very critical and especially that we're not gonna be doing this every 10 years, you know, this is our shot. We have one and that's it. So we need to make sure that it is within scope. We need to push very hard that it does happen, you know, that it becomes part of the consideration and that, you know, hopefully uh, it will be acted upon um, because we're not going to redesign this, uh, this whole area uh, anytime soon. So it, it is very, very critical to, uh, to make it part of the proposal, part of the scope and that it is uh, evaluated. Um, Perhaps, maybe, and you can tell me what, what's appropriate, Layla. Um, one of the final tasks is uh, to assess alternatives. Task 21 is labeled alternatives. And there are some, there are several standard environmental impact alternatives that, that it lays out specifically saying that a no action alternative needs to be evaluated a no unmitigated significant adverse impacts alternative, a reduced density alternative. I wonder how specific we can get in asking, in, in saying that alternatives should be included as well. Yeah, so because this project is uh, so broad and so big, you know, and it, it is uh, basically, it would create 20 million um, square feet of additional uh, air rights. I repeat, 20 million. It's like unheard of, uh, you know, it's especially for such a small, uh, small area, you know, small uh, perimeter. Um, so because of that, then we have the ability to, uh, to demand that other uh, alternatives be um, evaluated. And this is where we have, you know, a, a good opportunity to make the case. Um, so I, I think that, you know, whether we say that, you know, it should be an alternative or it should be added in uh, this particular proposal as a revised uh, proposal, um, honestly, I would leave it up to, uh, to the uh, uh, Empire State Development Corporation to decide which route they, they want to take. 
I would prefer that it is part, that it is not an alternative, but that it is the proposal, you know, that the proposal sponsored by um, the uh, ESD is a proposal that calls for the relocation of the garden, that it is planned, that it is thought, that it's not just an alternative, because typically alternatives are studied, their environmental impact is studied, but that doesn't mean that we're going to go with the alternative. More likely than not, especially in this political context, we're going to go with what is in front of us. So we want to make sure that what is in front of us is something that we like enough. Uh, you know, the goal, once again, is not to, you know, scream and yell and say that we don't like it, but it's really to make it better so that we can like it. You know, the, the ideal scenario is that in the end, we work closely with, you know, the, the, the different stakeholders so that the proposal, uh, you know, gains CB5 support. That's, that's really the goal. And this is something, hopefully, that, you know, we can start to shape uh, now. Um, so I, I think we absolutely need to call for alternatives, but the, the uh, you know, areas where we really want these changes to be included, I think we would uh, ask for them to just be simply deemed in scope. That's helpful, and for what it's worth, I agree 100% with making a strong statement for it just being fully in scope. Um, uh, Clayton, did, did that address your uh, question comment? Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, John Raybar. Uh, thanks, Layla. Um, so I had a couple of notes that I thought I'd like to bring to everyone's attention. Um, so one of them is about uh, the station flow. Um, so it says in the document that additional public transportation improvements under consideration include creating a below grade east west corridor between the 30th Street, 34th Street Penn Station 123 lines and the 34th Street Herald Square subway stations. And it doesn't make any suggestion that this would include the creation of a free transfer opportunity between those two stations. And I think that that is something that we um, should raise because I think that just having, you know, an underground long hallway that doesn't provide the opportunity uh, to transfer between those two stations without having to swipe in a second time um, is just something that I think we should raise because it's not clear okay. in the document. Um, and then additionally, in terms of station entrances, um, I'm sure that ADA accessibility will inevitably be a large part of this scoping document, but in the end, I could only count one new elevator that is going to be built um, at, in this entire project in terms of, um, you know, subway station accessibility at the uh, one, two, three stop for the, for 34th Street Penn Station. And, you know, just because, you know, the MTA is already very slowly adding more ADA accessible station access throughout the system, I just think that this project should also do more than what could be, what I would describe as like the minimum requirements in terms of improving station access, because it seems like there's only going to be perhaps one additional ADA entrance created. Okay, okay. Uh, definitely something that uh, we can add in the um, the scope of uh, of the proposal. Um, any other uh, comments or questions? Uh, we're going to try to really stick to uh, transit and, and transportation before we move on to the other um, areas. Um, members of the committee, uh, especially the uh, transportation committee, do we have any? Uh, comments from uh, members of uh, TNE who wish to make some comments. Okay, seeing none, um, let's move on to, um, so one area that um, I think is important for us to consider is actually the funding. Um, so if you, if you look closely at, you know, the way the proposal is, uh, is structured, the goal really of this uh, redevelopment is uh, to actually provide, I mean, so one of the goals um, is to actually provide funding um, through this uh, upzoning mechanism um, that would then, you know, unlock capital that currently doesn't exist uh, to actually do those uh, transit upgrades that uh, are part of the, uh, the master plan. Uh, once again, just to make it very, very clear and reiterate what EJ uh, said previously, 
the master plan is not what is in front of us. Okay, so we don't know what the master plan is going to be. All we know is that there is a big land use uh, proposal and upzoning uh, where uh, the governor uh, purchases land in these areas through eminent domain or negotiation and then upzones these areas, meaning that uh, he basically creates additional uh, er uh, allowed density and he sells this density and through the proceed of this sale this will finance and fund uh, the below grade uh, improvements so uh, you know some have actually made the analogy that uh, it's uh, it's using basically you know our uh, air, air rights and you know our air and development uh, uh, potential as an atm where you know you don't have the cash so it's like okay you know we create additional density we sell this density and that um you know creates uh funding so there is a case to be made given who the stakeholders are in in this uh, process that you know maybe um alternate sources of funding should actually be considered and that would uh, dramatically change the scope of uh, this proposal if all of a sudden uh, you know we were to find uh, eight billion dollars which is you know what this project has been uh, slated to uh, to generate and what we're told the master plan uh, will cost um, then you know if we were, were to find eight billion dollars there would be no need for this particular development maybe there's a case to be made for an upzoning i don't know uh but certainly you know this particular project is is really being put in place to raise the, those funds so as ej described the you know the stakeholders are uh new jersey transit so it's the state it's the neighbor uh it's new jersey um the long island railroad this is mta this is new york state and then amtrak amtrak is federal and Amtrak happens to be the owner of the train station, okay, through, you know, complicated, uh, for complicated reasons of, uh, of ownership. Amtrak, federal agency uh, or federal entity, um, is uh, actually the owner of the train station. So I think there's a case to be made that, uh, you know, and given the prominence of the station that is, you know, a regional hub and given the prominence of the region has, you know, national uh, implications, there's a case to be made that you know this project should be funded with federal money. Um, once again, if it were to be funded with with um, federal money, then there would be no need for this particular development. So, um, I would like to uh, have us consider you know adding uh, the funding uh, as being part of the scope, and that the scope should basically be revised because uh, more federal money should be poured into uh, improving Penn Station rather than you know creating density that would would basically be negatively impacting community board five you know with additional uh, traffic and shadows and uh, uh, you know impact caused by uh, additional density while it would not really benefit us directly um so um you know I, I think the scope should be revised to include uh that that language but i would love to hear uh, your thoughts on, uh, on on that and if you guys don't share any thoughts i will assume you agree <laughs> okay no no thoughts anybody wants to um add on to uh, to this topic of funding okay seeing none um I, oh uh, chris yeah chris go ahead yeah this is this is mostly a, a question um and, and not necessarily a concrete suggestion i'm a little confused still about what it is regarding funding that we can actually say because most of my funding questions sort of as you alluded to are not actually about this scoping document itself, but about the master plan more generally. Um, is it possible for us to have, to, to look at alternate ways of, of raising revenue, particularly through taxes, to have that be incorporated in the scoping plan, or because that touches on the remastering rather than this up zoning, is that outside of, of our purview right now? 
Um, the, the, the sound quality is not excellent, but I think I gathered the gist of, of your uh, question. So um, we can certainly do that. Basically, in order for a project that is uh, state run to, to basically be considered, the state or you know, like the public entity needs to demonstrate the need for this particular project. So if we can say, well, actually, the reason why you're doing this land use development is to generate funding, but actually you can get your funding elsewhere, whether it is through taxes or through, uh, you know, federal funding or, you know, through other mechanisms, um, then the need cannot be demonstrated any longer. And this is part of, you know, this would be determined through, you know, the scoping process. Um, so at that stage, we're not really uh, in a position to say where the money should come from. Um, I personally believe that, you know, given who the stakeholders are, there's a strong case to be made that it should be federal funding. Uh, but certainly, you know, other uh, forms of funding could totally come into play. But right now, once again, we're not really commenting on the merits. We'll have an opportunity to do that. Uh, but what, what I would like to include is to say, you, you actually have a, a challenge and the burden is upon you to prove that you need to do this project, that it is necessary. And we believe that you can get money elsewhere and that we Community Board 5 should not be hit with the full burden of generating the revenue so that you can do these upgrades that you know, I think everybody agrees that, you know, Penn Station needs to be modernized and improved. I mean, there's a great need. Nobody, you know, objects to that. But the way it's being done um, is, is problematic and the source of funding can be replaced. And, you know, so basically this is what, you know, this comment would, uh, would do at, at the scoping phase. Does, does that address your, your question? Uh, that, that absolutely does answer my question. Yeah, thank you. I'm sorry that I didn't get it for the first time around that you were explaining. Yeah, no, no, no worries. I, I think that, you know, everybody, I mean, you know, comprehending the, the whole process is, is, is pretty, uh, you know, deep and, and intense. So, yeah, no, no, totally. Um, Vicky, uh, our board chair, go ahead. Uh, Leila, I just have a question on, just for clarification on process. Whatever we request, like the change in, in funding that you are suggesting, do we have to give a long explanation or do we just request it? Um, you gave a lot of good reasons why we would like that. Do we put that in or is it just a request for alternate funding? Um, I, I think we need to be as, as specific as we can so that our comments are not lost in, uh, you know, the, the, the thickness and the density of, you know, all the comments that uh, the, uh, the agency is going to, uh, to receive. You know, obviously we're not going to be the only ones commenting. So we want to give as much of an argument as to why, uh, you know, once again, the, the, we need to explain why we believe that funding is part of the scope and, you know, it is part of the scope because the, because it's a public project, um, the, the, uh, the, the, the entity needs to demonstrate the need. You know, it, it's not like, well, you know, one individual wants to, you know, develop their land and, you know, it's, it's a private development and uh, here because it's public, they need to demonstrate that, uh, you know, this is the need, that this is the only way to achieve this goal and that there's no alternate solutions that would be less impactful. Um, so if you can make the case that, well, actually, if the you know, federal, you know, if the president were to, you know, see this project favorably, you know, like the master plan for redevelopment of Penn Station, and were to, you know, generously decide that there's going to be a 8 billion funding line in the next uh, federal budget, then the need for this particular land use action would disappear. Now, there could be another rationale, you know, I think that adding density to this particular area is, you know, pretty sensible. Uh, but this particular project would no longer be relevant. Okay, because they also, in addition to talking about the redevelopment, um, the reason for it being fundraising, they, the proposal talks about the need for more office space and the need for 
better buildings and a more, um, you know, a better environment around Penn Station. So it's a combination uh, on their part. I mean, the main reason is, is the money, but they also bring in a lot of other, uh, what they think would be viable uh, reasoning for doing the uh, redevelopment. Absolutely. I mean, they, they, they name those as, as benefits that we should look forward to. The reality, though, is that, you know, the governor is not in the business of redeveloping blocks of New York City. Mm -hmm. There has to be a, a broader purpose right. for the governor to, you know, use eminent domain. I mean, if the, if the state is the owner in full right of, you know, particular sites, you know, they, they have jurisdiction. I think that's, you know, it's totally fair. But in this process, this land belongs to private owners who are, you know, residents and stakeholders of the city of New York. And the city of New York has their way of doing business. I mean, if the Department of City Planning believes that there should be a rezoning, it could be, you know, city driven. The reason why it is state driven is because of the, you know, the state regional implications of the transit upgrades. And the reason this proposal is being, uh, you know, put forth in front of us is because of the need for funding, because there is no funding from the state of New Jersey, there's no, no funding from the state of New York, and there's no funding from, from uh, the federal government that would be sufficient to basically go ahead with the master plan. Right. That's the rationale for this particular proposal. Right. Okay, thanks. <laughs> um, I see that uh, Matt Hartman has his hand up. Mark, go ahead. Matt, go ahead. So it sounds like, it, it, to, to Vicky's kind of question, it was how do we, I think, how do we sort of very succinctly talk about what the issue is? And is it accurate that it's the, that the cost to CB5 is really related to the sort of FAR that is, like the, the size of these buildings and could we ask, could we put something in there that talked about just any indication from any other agency outside of, or if it's inclusive of the city that says there is a need for this. Otherwise, it's, it seems like their, their kind of goal number two is the only reason they're doing it, which is on page 12, that just says it's getting developed to, to to fund this specific, just to fund, to fund Penn Station. So it, I guess, so my question is, is there something that we could point to uh, that says there is not a need or there's a need for development up to X amount of FAR that's not 33 that, that they should be referring to? Well, I mean, we, we can get into the, 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 you know, details of how much FAR as far as how much revenue that would bring. The reality is that we, we have not been really provided with this information. We don't know what is going to be the funding mechanism. Are they going to sell these FARs? Is it going to be a bidding war? Is there going to be a RFP to purchase these FAR? Is there, I mean, who's going to be the agency representing this density? How, how, we don't know. We don't have the answers to, to these questions. So, um, at the moment, uh, we know through this document that you know they're working with city agencies, whether it's the Department of City Planning, DOT, um, you know, probably other agencies, uh, if it's possible. Uh, but these agencies are not on record one way or another, saying you know whether they support or uh, you know have you know caution about, about the, the proposal, we, we don't really know. So I think that it's, uh, you know, it, it's fair to say there should be other forms of funding and uh, therefore the need for this proposal uh, would be, you know, put in, in question and uh, therefore the scope should, should be altered. D does that make sense? Yeah, thank you for clarifying that. Okay, great. Uh, Clayton, you have uh, another comment and then I think we, we should move on because we have much more to, uh, to cover, but Clayton, go ahead. Well, when it comes to funding, one other thing that I'm wondering if we can work this into our recommendations is the cannibalization of incentivizing commercial space uh, from East Midtown. We spent years and years and years and years helping and participating in the advocacy for the East Midtown rezoning, not to mention Hudson Yards. And the city 
has spent many years justifying those efforts and identifying Hudson Yards and East Midtown as the two most critical areas in need of incentivizing commercial real estate development. So given that, how does that affect what we can advocate for if the argument now is we're going to use this completely different area to raise funding for these much needed blah, 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 how is it impacted? How would that demand be impacted by what we have spent years claiming our priority was, which is East Midtown and Hudson Yards, especially given now that we expect with COVID for the demand in general to plummet citywide? Yeah. How can we, what language can we use to meaningfully include that in our recommendation? Yeah. Uh, so this is going to fall into the bucket of, um, uh, that is actually a pretty big bucket uh, of the uh, urban design, historic resources, and socioeconomic impact. So, in, in you know, in reality, is it it is a socioeconomic impact. Uh, socioeconomic impact, you know, the most obvious is, uh, for example, you know, direct residential displacement, which actually will happen and is going to be studied, and uh, you know, more likely than not, will not rise to the level of significance. And I, I will explain that in in a moment. Um, but um, then there is the, you know, the business displacement, you know, a number of businesses are going to close because the buildings are going to be sold and demolished. Uh, you know, some local uh, stores and office space is, is going to, uh, to disappear. But further than that, as you're saying, it is basically going to create a, uh, you know, an, a, an influx of uh, commercial uh, real estate uh, in close proximity to others, uh, you know, some in our district, some in uh, in Ward Four, um, and uh, it is perfectly valid to wonder if it's legitimate, and certainly it should be evaluated. Um, so I, I think it's it's totally fair to uh, to to actually ask that this becomes part of the scope. Um, so unless uh, someone has further questions about the, uh, the funding, um, I think we can move on to uh, the, uh, the next bucket, which um, is going to be the urban design, historic resources, and socioeconomic impact. Uh, maybe we can stay with the socioeconomic impact. Um, I think, Clayton, your, your point is very well taken. I think it's important that we uh, include, you know, impact, uh, like broad impact to the, uh, the, the commercial uh, real estate market. We don't want a cannibalization uh, effect. Um, are there any other uh, areas um, of you know, displacement and uh, uh, business and residential impact that uh, you believe should be included in, in the scope? So I see some community board members have their hand raised, but I just want to say to members of the public, because I have seen a couple people raise their hand, uh, we will have a section of the meeting where, where you can speak. Um, if you're calling in, there'll be a way for you to raise your hand. Um, but for now, um, we're only having community members, uh, community board members participate. So thanks. Sorry, Layla. Thank, thank you, Joseph, for, for this reminder. Uh, yeah, we, we will open up the floor to, uh, to members of the, uh, of the public and uh, those in, the, in, in attendance. Um, I see that um, Dave Achilles has his uh, hand up. Dave, go ahead. Yeah, I'm not sure this is the proper place to bring this up, but whenever we've seen these huge developments, we've been concerned about uh, hospitals and places for the homeless and around transportation hubs like Madison, uh, like like the, the Garden and uh, the Long Island Railroad and Penn Station, there's always a homeless situation. And I don't know if this is a proper place to insert something about our concern with this massive, huge development of office space. There's some concern be made for the city in general in terms of homelessness. Yeah, I think I think it's a, it's a very good point. Um, and Currently, I didn't see any language addressing this uh, specific issue of homelessness and, um, and hospital needs. And um, I think that it is very important that it is assessed in the environmental um, impact statement. Um, I see that uh, Jordan uh, Goldman has his hand up, Jordan. Thank you, Leila. Uh 
I wasn't sure where to bring this up again, but I thought this bucket was probably the most appropriate. Um, to what extent should we consider coordinating with the community board for when it comes to these issues? Um, you know, we're, we're, of course, CB5. We have our own concerns for our own community board, but it's a shared space. And my concern is given the number of stakeholders, if CB4 says something slightly different from CB5, will that cancel out? It's, it's just a more of a process question, not, not the specifics. And I don't have an answer, but I, I just wanted to ask the question. Yeah, no, I, I think it's it's a very very good point. Um, so uh, the board, the board office and <clears throat> the, uh, the the board leadership is has actually reached out to CB4. Um, I think that you know the, the the contact and communication with them has been a little bit uh, slower, given you know a whole set of circumstances. You know, it's the summer, uh, we're in the middle of the pandemic, but uh, we certainly intend to work very closely with them. Um, right now, you know, given that we're uh, providing only 20 days to put together uh, something, we felt that, you know, it was really important to organize this meeting and, you know, get a set of recommendations. But our goal, our intention is really to work very closely with them, uh, similarly to the way we worked with uh, other uh, community boards in uh, the process of East Midtown. I think that, you know, there's strength in numbers and, uh, you know, they, they probably share a number of our concerns and, uh, you know, they are technically less impacted because what's happening is really in our district, but actually their board has been, uh, like a member of their board has been appointed to the CAC, which is the, uh, the Community um, Action Council, um, that uh, the, uh, uh, the ESD has appointed as part of the review process of this, of this proposal. So they are involved and, you know, the governor wants that and we want that too and we, we want to work closely uh, with them. And, you know, certainly we will circulate a draft of, uh, you know, this uh, recommendation that we're going to put together tonight and uh, you know going forward uh, hopefully we'll have a little bit more time to you know better organize yeah absolutely that's what um, I figured thank you <laughs> yeah thank you uh, BJ you have a question go ahead thanks Leila appreciate all the information you're sharing um, I have a couple of uh, multi-pronged uh, comment and question one is is it only commercial that's going to go up commercial office space or is there any um, opportunity are they looking at affordable housing as well or mixed use okay so currently there is it is not part of the proposal um actually if you, if you look at the numbers uh the uh the, the incremental difference between the no action and the action would actually bring the number of additional residential uh, units to basically zero. So they're planning to develop zero uh, residential uh, units. That being said, the my understanding, and you know, the, there are many unanswered questions at this point. But my understanding is that the zoning, the underlying zoning of uh, the area, would be commercial, and therefore, in a commercial district, a residential development is as of right. So it could be a possibility that one of those sites would become residential. And as such, uh, it could be market rate or affordable. And as such, the impact of these residential developments are entirely excluded from this environmental study, meaning that, you know, if a building were to be residential, uh, you know, let's say a large residential building gets built, there would be no uh, environmental impact uh, study on the, in the effect on local schools, um, you know, possibly creating overcrowding, uh, the, uh, you know, access to, uh, you know, park and open space, all of that is entirely excluded. So this is something that uh, we may want to ask them that they consider adding, uh, you know, the possibility of a scenario where some of these slots would become residential, but as of now, it is not part of the proposal at all. Gotcha. And then um, I just want to tack on to the, um, the transit transportation piece where, um, you know, like if you go to any other countries like Paris, Korea, Japan, the signages are in multi-languages and only in the U.S., like in Penn Station, Amsterdam, we don't see that. We only see it in 
one language, English. So at some point to be able to say, you know, make those signages available, especially if we want to make the city uh, recovers from, you know, COVID-19 and, and more and more tourists are coming. But yeah. related to that, well, this the COVID- be, This would be more on the, the, uh, the, the proposal itself and not really in the scope of what we believe should be assessed to determine, you know, the environmental impacts of, uh, of, of the development. But I think it's definitely something that, uh, that you know, should be advocated for. I, I agree. Right. And then um, I don't know if it's within the scope, but one of the comments is like, if they're making this commercial, you know, you saw the success of Columbus, Cir Columbus Circle subway station where they have an underground, all those shops. So this could be an opportunity if they're expanding that corridor and area to really offer to both minorities, MWBs, and offer those opportunities, right, to whether open up businesses. And I and I and tacking on to what David said earlier, there's so many homeless as it is even outside now, 34th between seventh and eighth, in that open space, there's so many homeless people there. So I think again, there's going to be an incredible amount of you know displacement as well as you know uh, people that are going to be whether businesses and both homeless that's going to be displaced. So it is a concern to me as well. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So making recommendations on specific uses is not part of the scope, but definitely the impact on uh, disp displacement to the homeless population should be studied and that, that should be added in, in our uh, recommendation for the scope. Um, I see that Chris, you have your hand up, go ahead. Yes, so I have uh, two questions. I'll start with the first, which is actually related to uh, um, the homeless issue, they call out specifically the Antonio Oliveri drop-in center. Um, that's one of that's on one of the blocks that will be, that will be made into pens out. Um, and this is my first time giving comments on a scoping document, so I'm not sure if the language they have is just sort of typical language, but it's, it's rather uncommittal when it comes to whether they will recommend some sort of strategies for mitigating that loss. Um, I'm wondering if there's anything we can do to ask for a more firm commitment that they will actually propose some solution. Because, I mean, if the plan goes through, it's, it's getting demolished. So it, it seems like a, a concrete thing that will need to be addressed. Um, and I, I am concerned that they would find an excuse not to propose mitigation strategies. That's my first question. Yeah. So it, it's actually the, the, the whole process is, uh, you know, of, of the environmental uh, impact statement is, is a little bit of a dance and a little bit of a, you know, artificial exercise where basically criteria are set. And then if you are below the threshold, we recognize that there's a negative impact, but it does not require mitigation. If you're above the threshold, we recognize there's a negative impact, it has to be mitigated. But at times there are negative impacts that cannot be mitigated and the project still goes through. So, you know, right now we are at the beginning, we need to make sure that all these issues are in scope. And something to keep in mind is that we can ask for, you know, specific, uh, you know, issues to be added to the scope. For example, you know, we want to add Madison Square Garden. It should be within the scope. But we can also say, we don't like the criteria that you're using. We believe that your formula is inadequate. And we believe that, you know, artificially deciding that, uh, you know, moving less than 200 residents is below the threshold and therefore it doesn't have to be mitigated. We believe that, you know, moving, you know, relocating any residence is a problem and this is where your threshold is. Um, so we can certainly also, you know, make recommendations on adjusting the threshold. Um, so I think that, you know, in, in the case of, uh, you know, the homeless population and some of the social services that are very important, uh, we can say that, you know, even though they don't, uh, you know, they fall under the threshold, they should be uh, mitigated and uh, a solution should be, uh, should be found for, uh, for these institutions. Great. I would, I would be very supportive of, of us including something like that. Um, and that actually leads directly into my next comment, which was about the uh, indirect residential displacement. Um, so that was one of the places where it did not meet their threshold for consideration. 
um, because they're not creating more than 200 units. Um, I think that that we should ask them to still include the and most mitigation plans for indirect residential displacement. Um, I believe the direct residential displacement, the figures were also below their thresholds for what would uh, necessitate a review and they are voluntarily choosing to include that in the review anyway. I think that we should ask them to extend that to the indirect residential displacement. Yeah, I, I wholeheartedly agree. Um, I think that the, uh, you know, the, the residential displacement uh, assessment is quite interesting because um, the, the, the stock of buildings, of residential buildings in this particular area is, is very specific. We don't have luxury condos. Uh, these buildings have been there for many, many, many years. Uh, some of them are uh, rent stabilized. Um, so the displacement is not just, you know, oh, well, you know, we're demolishing a couple of buildings and, you know, hopefully these people can, you know, go and live uh, on another block in the vicinity. Um, the, 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 the makeup of uh, this, you know, residential stretch of, um, of Manhattan is, is very specific and really cannot be replaced or, you know, found uh, anywhere else. Uh, so I think it's, uh, you know, for those reasons, very important to, uh, to add language to that, totally. Uh, do you have any other comments on, on that topic, uh, Chris? Uh, no, not right now. Okay, great. Um, other uh, comments on, on this topic? Socioeconomic impacts. Okay, seeing none. Oh, yeah. Uh, Jordan, go ahead. Hi, Liv. I'm actually just, um, I saw, I was reading the comments. It looks like July Yang, who's a member, um, wants the comments but can't raise her hand. So. Oh. Thank, you, thank you for bringing that to uh, my attention. Um, July, oh, but July is actually not a member of um, either committees. Oh, I'm sorry. Is, is she among the attendees, uh, Joseph? Uh, yes, she is. Okay, all right. Uh, given that she's a member of our board, <laughs> um, we're going to bring her in uh, among the, uh, the, the panelists. And um, if any of you uh, board members of CB5 uh, wish to speak, uh, just uh, let Joseph know so that he can uh, bring you into the, uh, the panelist uh, room. So, uh, July, uh, go ahead, you're recognized. Thank you for recognizing me, Leila, and thanks, Jordan, for catching that. Um, so I have two comments. One is based upon, um, and I'm not sure if this is the appropriate stage to bring that up, but certainly we could, uh, if the committee members agree, we could uh, request for CB5 and CB4 uh, residents, uh, businesses to receive priority consideration in building this project. Uh, it's a very big project. There's going to be a lot of jobs created in the 16 or so years um, in the estimation time. Um, so that's my comment number one. Comment number two is, um, it is true that the area has relatively few residential uh, buildings, but I happen to live in one. I am on 29th Street between 7th and 8th Avenues. So um, Penn Station South, site two is one block away from me. Um, I am considering moving, knowing that there will be construction in the next 15, 16 years. Um, Penn South development, the, what used to be the Michelama building, which turned into a very successful co-op, uh, which ranges between 8th and 9th avenues and 28th street and 23rd street. That's a, that's a development with um, a number of buildings, probably I'm not sure exactly the number of units, but no less than five, 800 units. Um, how is the project going to make sure that the demolition will be done in a safe manner? Not only to, call, not, only to not cause health concerns for the passengers traveling through Penn Station, but also the residential households that will reside in the area in the next 15 years. That is a very prolonged exposure of health concerns. Uh, yeah, um, 
So definitely the uh, health considerations are, uh, you know, considerations that can, that should actually be uh, part of the, uh, the review process. Um, I am not sure how uh, far around the development sites um, the review process, <clears throat> I'm sorry, the review process is going to go. Uh, so definitely this is something that we should make a recommendation so that, uh, you know, it's not just impact to those blocks that are being redeveloped, but also the, uh, the, the neighboring uh, properties. So definitely this is within scope. Thank you. Other um, questions, comments by uh, members of our committees? Okay, so seeing none, uh, we're gonna keep moving on to um, the uh, sort of like bulk of uh, what is in front of us, which is the urban design. Uh, so to, you know, to try to put things in, in context, uh, you know, as you can see on the map, the, uh, the, the proposed um, area for redevelopment is actually fairly small. You know, it's a, a total of, uh, um, you know, like five blocks, six blocks, uh, you know, depending on how you count, you know, half blocks, uh, two half blocks make a whole block, I don't know. Uh, but it, you know, it, it's much smaller than say Hudson Yards or uh, East Midtown. It's really, you know, very concise uh, little area. Uh, this area is going to receive uh, the permission to build density, to build FAR um, that has never been seen before in Manhattan. Uh, some of these buildings will have a 33 FAR. So uh, what is FAR? FAR stands for floor area ratio, and it is basically the uh, amount of square feet at the ground level multiplied by the ratio that has been uh, determined. So in that case, you take basically the, the base land and you multiply it by 33. But of course, you don't have to build a, a monolith that would be 33 stories and covering the entire, uh, you know, plate of, uh, of your land. Uh, typically, you know, as you know, buildings tend to have you know, these recesses. And let's say, you know, for the sake of the argument that uh, you would cover only half of your land, then you would have a 66 story tower. Um, but if you get creative, you would have a 80 story tower or a hundred story tower. Um, it is evaluated that with that type of density, these buildings would be a thousand foot tall, probably 1500 and probably even more. Um, this density has the potential for creating the tallest building in the, um, uh, Northern Hemisphere, in the uh, Western Hemisphere, and probably in the entire world. So, um, and this area is already pretty densely built, you know, it's not like there's uh, no other tall building in the vicinity. Um, so the question is, how do you make it work? How can you fit such a huge density uh, in uh, an area that is already pretty densely built and what impact is that going to have on your surroundings. So one of my big concerns is actually the impact that that would have on the Empire State Building. You know, it's one block away and, uh, you know, shielding the, uh, the view corridor onto what some consider to be the most important or most significant landmark in, in the world um, is really problematic. So um, right now, the environmental, the, the, the scope uh, document suggests that there's going to be a review of uh, visual resources, uh, but I think it's really important that we spell it out. And that going further, you know, it's not only just, you know, make sure you don't block the views of the Empire State Building, it's really, you know, comprehensive design on, you know, how, how you make it work, how you fit that, that type of, uh, of, of density uh, into, uh, into the area. So uh, my recommendation would be to add specific language to, uh, you know, the, the uh, view corridors onto uh, the Empire State Building. Uh, but actually Matt did some research for us on other uh, significant landmarks that are, uh, you know, considered view, view you know, visual resources. 
Um, so I think you know we, we should look into those. Um, but I would love to hear uh, other people's thoughts on uh, the uh, urban design and uh, the impact that uh, that's going to have. And I see that Dave Achilles has his hand up. Dave, go ahead. Yeah, for the incredible amount of GSF on this project, the public space seems like next to nothing. The public amenities, it, it's just amazing. So if there was something that these buildings could do instead of sheer office space to become offering more to the public uh, other than the obvious transportation hub, but other than that, there doesn't seem to be much in the way of public amenities as it stands now. Yeah, yeah, very true. I mean, they, they are proposing um, one tiny little plaza green area between uh, two very large buildings and uh, the existing uh, 33rd Street uh, closure would remain and they count that as a, you know, a open space. Uh, but it already exists, so it's it's uh, not an added benefit. Um, other thoughts on uh, the uh, the density? Uh, Clayton, go ahead. I have a question about the park land that would be cast into shadow by these developments. In this case, we're really talking about most nearby Harold and Greeley Square, actually. But I do wonder if beyond that, 33 FAR, I mean, would this hit the other parks in our district? I know that shadow, you know, the language um, is, is there already that, that there would, be, would trigger a shadow study and they look into mitigations or whatever, but the language seems very obtuse to me and I'm really unclear about what would be required were they to determine that a shadow would fall on the district, which is obvious. You know, it says we would then investigate mitigation. It's like, well, that is not a commitment. What does that mean? So one thing that I would want to ask is how can we try to nail down with more specificity which of our open public spaces, some of which are New York City parkland, would be cast into shadow? And what is the, miti what is the mitigation, if any, that we believe would be commensurate with that impact? Uh, yeah, very good point. You know, I, th I think it ties to, uh, you know, making a threshold recommendation uh, where, you know, it's not only uh, necessary that the shadows are studied, but that, you know, the threshold for mitigation uh, be, you know, meaningful uh, and that this mitigation also be meaningful. Because right now the mitigation that has been offered on other developments is actually just saying, well, you know, there's nothing we can do. <laughs> so uh, it, it's, uh, you know, I think we, we need to say that uh, if indeed there's going to be shadows on open space, um, it has to be mitigated in a significant way, which is basically remassing the building so that it doesn't cause so much shadows. Well, and actually, Leila, to that end, is there a way that we can, as we have in the past, in, in a normal Euler process, call for shadow impact studies for Bryant Park, for Madison Square Park, for anywhere that we think that this degree of FAR might actually impact. It's clear that the pedestrian plazas and Harold and Greeley Square will be impacted by this. But I'm curious also about the other parks in our district. Is that something we can get into scope? Yes, absolutely. So it should actually be, uh, you know, part of like the standard review uh, for, you know, a, a development of, uh, of that size. They should basically do a shadow study and tell us exactly where these shadows are going to hit. Um, so it, it should already be in scope, but I think there's no harm in, you know, reiterating that we have this expectation. And, um, and I think it, it's fair also to add language on, you know, what mitigations should look like. And what, what we believe the threshold should be. Uh, we, we also have a raised hand from Renee Kinsella. I'm just letting you know. Uh, yes, let's bring Renee Kinsella. Okay, oh, she went down the list. Let me unmute her one sec. Okay, yeah. Renee, can you speak? Yes, hi, thank you. Leila, just a question. With this density, will these, um, will the builders, buildings be allowed to sell any of the air rights? We don't know. We don't know how uh, this part of the uh, funding mechanism is gonna work. 
We so, know that you know there's going to be additional FAR and that this additional FAR that city is going to fund, but how we go from one to the other, uh, we don't know. Can that can can some sort of mechanism to ensure that the air rights don't land in other parts of the city be part of the scoping process? Um, I didn't even think of that. Oh my God. Oh my God. Um, yes, yes, we should, we should certainly mention that we have every expectation that, you know, these, this new added density can only be built on those sites. Very, very good point. Very good point because yeah, very, very good point. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you for bringing this to, to our attention. It could be an absolutely terrible loophole otherwise. Um, do you have any other uh, comments or questions, Renee? No, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Chris, go ahead. Uh, this is another question about sort of the specifics of, of the FAR, so I anticipate that we might not know this. Um, but looking at the background that they give on the East Midtown rezoning, um, it says that buildings were allowed to exceed the FAR if they undertook improvements to subway entrances and other you know, surface level subway improvements. Um, do we know if that's part of the, the package? And even if we don't know, would it be possible for us to request a consideration of what it would look like if keeping all other elements in place, they were not able to exceed FAR specifically for surface level improvements like subway station entrances that they would presumably already be building in their commercial office buildings just based on what the map says. Yeah, so the way each works is, is a little bit um, different. Um, basically, in, uh, in East Midtown, you can uh, increase the density of your development by using a base density, which is 15, on which you can add added density through various mechanisms. You can purchase air rights from uh, historic properties, including uh, St. Patrick's Cathedral, uh, Grand Central Terminal, uh, the Central Synagogue, or um, uh, St. Bartholomew. And uh, you can also get transit upgrades. And um, there, so th basically you can build this added density up to a 30 FAR. You cannot go above 30 FAR ever. It's, it's not permitted. Um, but in order to accomplish that density, you need you know, to either buy air rights, which, you know, they're already existing and it's, uh, you know, an outlet for these air rights to be used somewhere else, um, or uh, to do some transit upgrades, which have been listed and identified. And, you know, basically, if you can make the case that you're going to do, you know, uh, a, uh, you know, platform enlargement and adding a, uh, an escalator and building a new staircase, enlarging a staircase or, you know, something substantial, uh, either on site or off site, then uh, there is a determination that needs to be made that, yeah, okay, you know, it is worth a, you know, a two FAR or three FAR. And this is how you build your added density. So it's not really a, you know, you get, uh, you know, 100,000 square feet of additional development rights and you pay that much in exchange. It is, you know, you provide these upgrades that the city has identified as being ne necessary, and then you get the permission to build more, more density. And you also have to contribute to a fund um, that uh, serves the, the public well. So with uh, the, the fund <clears throat> basically you know, pulls all these resources from all these developments, and this many is used for ad grade, development such as uh, you know uh, closing a street beautifying uh, creating uh, you know a, um, uh, a better sidewalk or you know other types of, uh, of projects in the particular case that is in front of us it is different it is the state taking away property knocking down buildings generating and upzoning selling these air rights and with the money once again you know, remember that the goal is to generate cash. 
The goal is not to, you know, okay, we give you the, you know, you developer the prerogative of, you know, doing that upgrade and in exchange, you have the permission to build a little more. This is a very clear, you know, sort of transactional proposal where, you know, the governor takes over, knocks down everything that's there, develops this uh, added density, sells it, and with the cash does whatever it is that, you know, is, will be called for in the, in the master plan. So um, how exactly that transaction is going to happen Personally, I don't know. Uh, I'm hoping that you know eventually, when that phase comes, you know the uh, the sponsors of the project will be able to explain that to us and, uh, and that it will make sense. Um, but right now, you know, this the, the only thing we understand is that it is going to be entirely transactional. D does that address your your question, Chris? Yes, it certainly does and I appreciate the background on the, the East Midtown rezoning since I wasn't on the board for that. Um, I am still a little concerned. Um, I, I do understand that it's mostly a revenue generator, um, but since sort of the, the secondary and tertiary goals of the project are to make the realm improvements and improve the nearby subway stations, I, I could imagine there being some sort of uh, deal basically where they do um, have an incentive to make, you know, to expand a subway entrance, sort of yeah. as laid out on the map. Um, and sort of the, the heart of my, of why I bring that up is just because I've seen many buildings where the commercial office buildings, where the subway entrance is integrated into say the lobby of a building. Um, and I, I personally find it inappropriate that that's treated as a gift to the public from the developer. And so I just like to, keep that out of the picture if possible, but I understand that that's a little further down the road. Yeah, I mean, th those types of agreements are, are very much built into the, you know, the city zoning code. You know, there are lots of, uh, you know, special districts where, you know, if you do this, then you can get, you know, a higher building and it is seen as, you know, a, a gift to, to the public. Um, here, because it's state-led, uh, it's, it's a little different. Um, I see lots of hands raised. Uh, Julie, I see your hand up. Go ahead. This is a follow-up to Dave Aquila's question about the lack of open space. Um, the East Midtown rezoning, they were able to generate new crops, I believe. And I was wondering if that's possible to mandate buildings of a certain size to provide public open space. The community. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I think that, uh, you know, it is certainly something when the time comes to really, you know, discuss the, the substance uh, that, that we should be asking for. I think we can ask in the scope that, uh, you know, the uh, open space be studied more carefully and that the threshold be lowered. I mean, the, the added density is going to be so crazy insane that I think that, uh, you know, there should be uh, adequate open space provided. Um, so, you know, we, we may want to add language uh, as it pertains to, to that part of the scope. Yeah. Um, I see that uh, BJ has her hand up. BJ, go ahead. Thanks, Leila, again. Um, I meant to ask earlier two questions. One is, given the um, economic crisis and the economic impact to New York City, um, is this project still on track? And then the second part of my uh, comment slash question is, you know, um, as many of us know, during concerts and um, sports games met around Madison Square Garden, the traffic is just absolutely horrific. And especially during when you're trying to get an Uber or, and then a lot of one-way streets, right? So I think, um, and I don't know where this fits in, but it's around, you know, traffic flow um, that's gonna be impacted both because of the construction time and then what will happen because of the, the more uh, buildings and, the, and more population people coming to the area? Yeah, so, you know, typically <clears throat> the, uh, any uh, land use project will have, uh, you know, a, a traffic study. This is standard and, you know, within the scope of, uh, of the review of a, of a project, we can certainly flag it as, as being an issue. Um, <clears throat> from what we understand, um, it is possible that a number of these streets will become pedestrian and therefore, you know, the, the case for uh, studying vehicular traffic would be moved. 
Um, but you know, th this is something that we may want to flag in the uh, in the scoping document. <coughs> Sorry. And I see that um, I think uh, oh, they're still on track with the economic impact. Very much so. As you could tell, you know, the governor uh, released the scope 10 days ago, 13 days ago. So, yeah, uh, I think the, the, the philosophy is to basically consider that, you know, it's anybody's guess what will be the current condition of the city in 16 years. This is a long term uh, project. You know, they don't anticipate that um, it would uh, see any, uh, you know, substantial completion before I think they they quote 20, uh, 2038. So you know, it's it's not going to reach you know sort of like a substantial level of completion uh, before eighteen years, and therefore it's anybody's guess what the city would look like in eighteen years, and uh, you know they're making the assumption that you know the. Uh, uh, commercial uh, market will be uh, will be solid. Uh, Dave Achilles. Yeah, to sort of follow up on what PJ had to say in terms of the socioeconomic impact of Madison Square Garden, that for the last fifty years has been home to all of New York City's sports teams, as well as its chief entertainment arena. That uh, whether there's going to be an alternative in the proposal or what, whatever happens to the garden, certainly this is going to affect us somehow. And I'm wondering if that's a very, uh, possible to talk about in the scope. Um, yeah, I, I think it's it's fair. Although, you know, I think no one is really recommending that the garden be, uh, you know, abandoned and uh, eliminated altogether. I think it's uh, just a, a question of, you know, finding it a, a more suitable location. Uh, so that it can remain a, you know, a, a vibrant uh, arena, uh, you know, both for sports and cultural events. Um, but, you know, certainly I think it's fair to say that, you know, the impact of relocating the garden should be looked into and make sure that, you know, there's no, no negative impact on, on that front. I, th I think it's fair. Any other uh, questions or comments on um, these uh, aspects? Uh, so we are in uh, urban design and uh, socioeconomic impacts. Layla, I'm sorry, it looks like Todd Shapiro had a question. Um, yes, you know, let's bring Todd Shapiro. Okay, one second, Todd, let me unmute you. Okay, you're unmuted. Yeah, Todd, go ahead, you're recognized. Todd, sorry, I'm clicking the unmute button, but uh, one second. You? There, I think we can, can hear, hear me you. now. Yeah, thanks. Go ahead, Todd. Okay, I joined a little late, but can you just explain for me, uh, I'm just observing this, the relationship between the, the expansion of, of, of transit capacity at this site and its potential expansion or limitation by the scope of the project that we're com commenting on? Uh, you know, are we pay, is is the is the governor and this plan painting himself into a corner? I thought I heard you say that that's not currently in the scope. We're just commenting on the space and the size of it and how it's going to impact in terms of uh, you know the mix of you know the overall type of project. But I mean, the things that I've read about it, it seems like the placement of Madison Square Garden where it is. It, this project may uh, paint the city, the state, and the whole region into a corner if they go ahead and do this and they don't have the ability to add enough additional capacity, right? That would be like a, a terrible missed opportunity. Is that something that, that we're not, it, it's not in the scope or we're not yet at that stage to comment on? Yeah, so uh, EJ actually uh, discussed that at the, at the beginning of the meeting. Um, EJ, do, do you want to, um, you know, bring uh, Todd uh, up to speed on where we stand on, on uh, uh, the, uh, the transit upgrades and the fact that we're only looking at this scope document and that the master plan has not yet been uh, put forth with a scoping document? Yeah, that's right. Um, Todd, what we talked about is that while the 
while the master plan for Penn Station and what improvements they want to make in terms of increasing capacity, which could be track reconfigurations, it could be track widening, it could be the introduction of through running, all of that would affect capacity. Um, their ability to do those expansions to existing tracks is severely limited by the garden right now. Um, so what we discussed is that in the context of this scoping discussion, we want to make sure that the scope is wide enough to keep all options on the table. Most specifically, um, creating possibilities for moving Madison Square Garden the way that Community Board 5 uh, backed in 2013 and that when MSG's current permit, 10-year permit expires in 2023, will theoretically be back in discussion. Um, so we talked about adjusting the, uh, the um, making an argument that the project area should encompass various blocks that um, have been cited as pot uh, potential redevelopment areas for um, Madison Square Garden. And we also discussed specifically um, saying that, that moving the garden should be noted within the scoping document to be explicitly in scope of what is being evaluated. Right. So that's something that I certainly I, I would want to understand when I vote on this full board. The other thing, which I think I heard one of the other committee members make, is that you know our government in dealing with these kind of things is notoriously backward looking, backward looking in how they interpret these things. I mean, I was just looking at the plan, and you know it's basically a series of huge office buildings, hotels, and commercial space surrounding Penn Station and Madison Square Garden. It's like if, if there's a new paradigm in place where the number of people that are going to be working in commercial office buildings uh, is going to, let's say, dramatically shift because people are not going to, I mean, that's, it, that's in the papers and that's like a whole new paradigm. Is that something that we should comment on very strongly? Because I think, you know, what's driving this is the idea that we must do these transit improvements and that we have to build these huge commercial office buildings to fund it. But like if the demand for commercial office space in cities all over the, all over the country and the world goes down by a third, then we're barking up the wrong tree. So you know, maybe, it's, maybe we as a community board can make sure that that is not overlooked. So uh, right now we're really commenting on the scope of the proposal and only on the scope of what is in front of us. So we totally agree with you and we agree with, with those comments, but there will be an opportunity to actually comment on the substance of the proposal itself. Uh, in, in the process and the different phases and in, in the review of a, uh, a big land, land use action like this one, the first step is uh, to really comment on the scope so that we can make sure that what is evaluated is exactly what we feel is important and significant and that we have an opportunity to shape that when the time comes to actually discuss the matter. Um, so all these comments are very valid, but they will come uh, for the next round of uh, review when we will have a uh, draft environmental impact statement that will basically tell us what the findings are, you know, what is the, the environmental impact of uh, this big uh, land use action. And, uh, and we'll have an opportunity to comment and hopefully to shape uh, what uh, that will look like. Thank you, that answers my questions. Thank you, Todd. And um, I see that uh, Zach has his hand up. Zach, go ahead. Thanks, Layla, and uh, please cut me off if um, this isn't necessarily appropriate for the topic of, of the discussion, but I think this pertains to both funding and to the socio socioeconomic impact. Um, does it make sense to potentially comment on kind of a value capture concept that's kind of pops up in urban planning? So, you know, with an example being that uh, owners of residential and commercial property that benefit from publicly funded infrastructure like subways you know, benefit from a rise in their property values and should such pay higher property taxes because of that benefit. Um, that, 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 is be not within, that, that is not within the scope. This is a very good point and this is something that we need to say for, you know, when we will actually discuss the proposal itself. But right now, once again, we're only discussing what should be deemed in scope 
and what should be evaluated in the uh, environmental impact statement. Gotcha, sorry about that. No, no, no problem, but hold on to that thought because uh, you know, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll have to actually review the proposal itself and weigh in on it pretty soon. Uh, do, do you have another, I think you had another part to your uh, question or comment, uh, Zach. Oh, no, that, that, that was it. Okay, okay, great. Uh, Chris, your hand is up, go ahead. Um, so this is sort of a combination of what Zach said and, and what Todd said, and I anticipate this might not be something that we can address at this stage, um, but is it possible to bake in a consideration purely when it comes to the revenue that would be generated by the project? Um, a consideration of COVID's impact on the office market? Would it be possible to ask for them to play out a situation in which office or commercial real estate demand drops precipitously um, on the on the off chance, which might, might not be that small of a chance, um, that the sort of failure of those office buildings would negatively impact their ability to generate revenue? Or is that just like the other considerations uh, not a topic of discussion for this group. Just no, I think that if, if we phrase it this way, it's, it's a very valid point because uh, we, we want to evaluate if there is no longer a market for commercial real estate and hotel real estate because they're also proposing a, a, a large hotel. Uh, which could, you know, suddenly see, uh, you know, a, a big, big recession. Um, so if those markets disappear, then what would be the alternate scenario? to raise those funds. So as you know, to go back to Renee's comment, um, would they allow for this density to be shifted elsewhere? I mean, right now we sort of like took it for granted that, you know, this added density will be used on site. Uh, but, you know, is, is it something, if all of a sudden the proposal is that, you know, this density can be shifted elsewhere, um, then the environmental review is different because then you know, you're not looking at the shadows from these particular buildings, you're looking at shadows from buildings you don't even know where they're gonna be. Um, so that needs to be uh, you know, brought into scope. And uh, same thing in terms of use, uh, you know, if all of a sudden the use becomes uh, residential, uh, you know, to go to BJ's uh, comments, then all of a sudden you, you need to evaluate you know, the impact on schools, uh, the impact on uh, hospitals and uh, you know, healthcare services and open space. Uh, because all of a sudden, you know, if there were to be a large residential building, the uh, proposed open space would not be adequate. I mean, there's, been, there's no park in this area. Where, where would all these children go? You know, so definitely if, if you frame it this way, then it becomes uh, you know, very appropriate to comment on that at the scoping period. Absolutely. Um, okay, moving on. Uh, do we have any further comments, things that have not yet been said uh, on, on these uh, topics? Okay, I see none. Um, so one more area that um, uh, on, on this bucket that I think is, uh, is important to uh, discuss is actually the impact to um, our historic resources. So my understanding is that there are no uh, landmarked buildings in, uh, in the area, meaning like landmark under the uh, uh, Landmarks Preservation Commission uh, of New York uh, law. Uh, but nonetheless, there are a number of uh, very historic and very significant buildings. Um, we had a uh, interesting conversation this morning with uh, the New York Landmarks Conservancy and uh, they actually have commissioned a, uh, a survey of all the, uh, the historic resources that um, they are currently you know, uh, pulling and, and working on and uh, we're hoping that they're going to be able to share that with us and uh, that, that will uh, greatly inform you know, the type of recommendation that we can make. Uh, but certainly we want to make sure that in the way the historic resources are assessed is not simply to come back to us and say, well, yeah, there's no landmark buildings and therefore no impact. That basically they really need to look at, uh, you know, the historic significance of the buildings, whether they are on, you know, any uh, LPC uh, designation list or a national register. 
um, it, it is uh, very important that uh, we, we pay close attention and that we frame uh, the, uh, the criteria and the threshold uh, in a way that you know, doesn't let uh, this, uh, you know, all this stock of historic buildings uh, go to the dumpster um, with, without any, uh, any concern. Um, so my recommendation would be to add language that you know the uh, the historic resources are uh, properly evaluated uh, based on you know hopefully we can uh, work with the uh, other preservation groups to basically flag specifically you know those uh, historic resources. Um, are there any comments or questions or thoughts on uh, the topic of um, historic resources in in the area? Uh, yeah, Clayton. Does the state care about the LPC, even if the LPC were to work with us on identifying specific sites? What, what have we seen in history about when a process like this goes on that's state run regarding city resources like this? Uh, good question. Um, it, it would, I mean, it would certainly set a precedent. I don't know if it's a good precedent or a bad precedent. <laughs> depending on, you know, how that would go. Um, you know, I, I think that if, um, you know, I, I think in the end, anything and everything is possible. You know, I, we, we've seen, uh, you know, interesting things being done. Like, uh, you know, it's something that I'm not a fan of, but it's called facading, where you basically, you know, you slice off, you only keep the facade and you knock down and everything else and you incorporate the facade into a larger development. Personally, not a fan, but you know, it is something that can be done and can be seen as being a mitigation step. Uh, so, you know, although, uh, you know, the likelihood that we'd be able to save every single historic building is probably unlikely. Um, I think it's really important to flag it as, a, as an issue and to make sure that, you know, the, the criteria to determine what is a historic building uh, is not simply, well, you know, it's not on LPC's list, so, you know, bring the wrecking ball. Um, any other comments, concerns on uh, the topic of uh, historic resources? No? Okay, moving on. And, um, okay, so we did talk about uh, reasonable alternatives. Um, I think that um, EJ got into uh, quite a bit of detail on what that would mean. I think that we, we really need to demand that there are uh, alternative, um, uh, reasonable alternative uh, scenarios that are uh, evaluated for all the reasons that we stated. Um, so, you know, that, that, that should be a uh, part of our request. Um, it, if, if that's okay, we can move on, uh, unless anybody has, uh, specific questions, concerns on, on this topic. Um, I think we, we talked about it already. Just want to make sure that, um, we're kind of like following the process. Yeah, Chris, go ahead. Sorry. I know I'm talking a lot, uh, and this might actually come up. Uh, in the public comment section, um, but would we be proposing that they look at a situation in which um, the transit expansion happens on the other side of the Hudson in New Jersey, um, or are we sort of shutting out that possibility by having them not included, or is the answer neither of the above? Um, yeah, you know, I, I think we, we want to uh, be both specific and vague at the same time. We basically want to know if we can accomplish what the master plan wants to accomplish, which, you know, once again, we don't know what the master plan is, um, without doing that massive redevelopment that is going to have, you know, negative impacts, relocation of residents and businesses and all of that. It's like, we want to know, and th there has to be, probably has to be a better way of doing it. And we want to know what that is and uh, what the benefits would be and what the cost would be. Then we want to be specific by saying, you know, we want you to make the case that, you know, we want you to evaluate what would happen if you actually get your funding elsewhere. Um, my position is that on the uh, Madison Square Garden, we should not uh, make it an alternative. We should ask that it is in the original proposal, but if they're reluctant to go that far, we should then ask that it, it becomes an alternative proposal. 
So, you know, I think we want to be both, you know, vague and, and open in general in, you know, show us what you have, show us what you can do, uh, you know, as, as a better uh, proposal. Um, and also specifically show us what would happen if you take X, Y, and Z steps. Got it. Um, and so asking them to consider the development taking place in New Jersey instead, that would be an example of being too specific since that's something that they would be addressing when they look at the whole universe of alternatives. Am I understanding that correctly? Um, say that again. I'm not sure I understand what you mean. Uh, I'm not sure I understand what I'm saying either. Um, but I, I, I know that there's talk about the actual project itself um, having an alternative where development happens in New Jersey instead of happening in Midtown Manhattan. I know that that's a separate conversation. Um, but would it be too specific of us to ask that they consider a situation in which the 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 fundamental assumptions of this this project that's before us right now, which are that Penn Station would continue to be this this hub of regional commerce, uh, of regional transit rather, um, where that assumption sort of goes away because the development is in fact happening in, happening in New Jersey. Um, so is it too specific of us to ask that they consider that situation because we anticipate that they would just have that on their minds already, or is that something that we should call out specifically as an option? Um, I, I, I think it's, um, it's very specific in a way that, uh, you know, involves a third party that, you know, is not in the room. Uh, you know, if the community in New Jersey were in the room and saying, you know what, we would really like to have this development and you should actually advocate for that. Um, I would be more favorable, but you know, they're, they're not in the room. I, I hate it when another community, you know, makes recommendations on what should happen in CB5. You know, it's like, oh yeah, yeah, put it in CB5. It's like, well, you know, wait. <laughs> um, so I, I think that we can make a recommendation that alternate, you know, alternative scenarios be evaluated for development elsewhere without necessarily being specific on where that could happen. Um, I think that that's fair. We also, we also want to make sure that you know they don't come up with you know uh, uh, vague or unrealistic uh, alternative scenarios that in the end just you know fit the bill as you know okay we did what you asked us to do but actually uh, you know it was so unrealistic that it really has no merit on uh, you know how that is going to impact and inform this this proposal. D does that make sense? That, that definitely does make sense. Thank you. Okay. Okay. All right. So uh, moving on, uh, the last aspect that I think is uh, important that we talk about is um, the notion of uh, public benefits. I know that it's it's kind of a loaded expression, uh, but you know, for lack of a better term, uh, you know, I'm I'm not referring to the direct public benefit of a uh, you know upgrade to our transit system system, I'm sorry, uh, but more in the sense of, uh, you know, what Hudson Yards was able to negotiate with uh, the, uh, the construction of the shed and, uh, uh, you know, other developments that basically included a, a component that was a benefit to the community. And, you know, we can think whatever we want of, uh, of the shed, uh, but at least there was an attempt. And um, I think it is fair to start to uh, consider, you know, if there is something that uh, Community Board 5 and Community Board 4, I think in, in that instance, it's super important that we work with, uh, with other boards, um, you know, would consider to be an important development that would be beneficial. So I don't know if it's a school, um, do we need a hospital, do we need a library, do we need a, uh, you know, some sort of like sports infrastructure that our children can use. I mean, currently the kids who live in, in uh, lower Manhattan have, you know, pretty much nowhere that is, uh, you know, sort of affordable or city run to actually do their sports. Um, you know, should it be something that is, uh, you know, culture centric, uh, education centric? Um, and I'm not suggesting that we have the, you know, the brilliant idea right now, but I think we should start thinking about it. And in the scoping, we should basically say that such uh, part of the development should be included and should be evaluated for uh, environmental impact. 
yeah, we might even want to get um, very specific, Layla. Ask number five currently specifically says, based on preliminary thresholds, the proposed project is not expected to trigger detailed analyses of schools, libraries, community facilities. Um, you know, we may want to call specifically for those options to be assessed um, as part of the scoping. So, so yeah. that they're not intentionally left out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So totally, but that that, that goes to uh, to BJ's comment on you know what happens if uh, these developments become residential. So we need to call on them to evaluate that. But on top of that, do we want to say you know okay, you're going to generate 20 million square feet of development out of all of that? Please carve out X amount, and this is going to be for us. This is basically, you know, the price that you pay to us for the sacrifice that you're asking us to make. Because quite frankly, and I know we're not supposed to comment on, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the project itself, but it is very sacrificial to Community Board 5. You know, it's like we're basically asked to, uh, you know, pay the price, have, you know, residents relocate, uh, suffer construction for uh, 15, 18, 20 years, uh, businesses relocated, um, uh, added density, more shadows, more bulk, more uh, pedestrian traffic to our district for the greater good of the region. I get it. And the greater good of the region is very important and very critical, but we're basically asked to pick up the tab. So I think it's totally fair to say, okay, you know, it's, we, we, we get it, but out of that, something really specific to our needs need to come out of this development. And, uh, and you know, m maybe we're going to say, well, you know what, we can't think of anything and, you know, it's, uh, we, we don't want it. Or, um, you know, we're going to say, well, actually, we would like uh, a school because our schools are overcrowded or we would like a hospital because uh, when there's a pandemic, actually, our hospital system collapses and 20 hospitals have been closed in the past 20 years. And it's about time that, you know, we shift this trend. You know, I'm just throwing ideas for, you know, food for thought. Um, you know, I, I don't have a, you know, particularly strong position, but, um, you know, I, I think that th this is something that we may want to, you know, bring up in, in the scoping period. And I see that Clayton has his hand up. Clayton, go ahead. So one thing that I loved, Gail, I love Gail Brewer to the moon and beyond, but one thing specifically that I love her for is over the course of the two years of the East Midtown Rezoning Steering Committee process, she really led the charge in where can we get a new park? And there were geographic limitations to that ambition. So the fact that that is not happening is no fault of hers there, or, and no fault of, the, of DCP or anybody else. There, there were extremely limited options for how that might actually come to pass and most of them were slivers anyway. But just to your point, Layla, about dreaming big and getting stuff in scope, the amount of FAR that we're talking about and what we are seeing on these renderings of these buildings that could go on these sites in this area is ridiculous. It's outrageous. And I, why don't we say that site six should be a park? Why shouldn't site six be open space? Why not? At the very least, can we have it be in scope that we consider the public benefit that not only our district, but the entire city is sacrificing, as you say, uh, for funding for whatever might happen at Penn Station or might not. Can one of these sites not be dedicated to people to breathe and have space and perhaps even to recreate. And I think that your point about, we've been talking a lot lately about youth recreation and I think that it's just more and more and more important. Um, and it's kind of a dream to think that in our district we would be talking about new open space, but perhaps this might be the last time that this is an appropriate context for that conversation. So whatever we can do to introduce language in the scoping session to accommodate just that investigation, I would be extremely in support of. Yeah, I think you make a very, very good point, uh, Clayton. Uh, BJ, you have your hand up. Go ahead, BJ. Yep. Um, Leila, since you said to dream big and think um, out of the box, I think two things that came to my mind is, one is, you know, when you go to Times Square around here, um, you either there's actually like a tourist 
center. And I think, you know, I think 34th Street, where we are, you know, uh, Madison Square Garden and with Empire State Building and in the vicinity, it's, it's well worth thinking about having some sort of a, a tourist office or, or tourists who come in. I think a lot of people get lost, you know, their point of uh, uh, reference is the Empire State Building and Macy's, but there's tons of, you know, worth, worthwhile areas around there, including the Koreatown, as well as the Flatiron District and Union Square. And I think often when people come out from Penn Station, particularly, people are lost unless it's the taxi uh, uh, dispatcher and there's no one guiding them. So some sort of like a tourist, you know, when you go to other countries where there's uh, a lot of tourism, they have these like standalone booths or, or cubicles where there is someone who's there directing, you know, in multi-language, by the way, with pamphlets guiding people in, uh, uh, to help them. The other thing is right now, you know, I live on 37th Street and right on 8th Avenue. We don't have a direct way to get to the airports, to LaGuardia, to Kennedy Airport, to Lincoln, you know, to uh, even New York Airport. So why not? Right now on Port Authority bus, there's these like uh, golden shuttles or these buses that take you to uh, to LaGuardia Airport. But again, when, if this is going to be a commercial area and become a hub, attracting so many people, both for sports and entertainment and, and, and really revitalizing this area more around 8th and 9th Avenue, it'd be great to think about having some sort of availability of transportation um, to offer direct ways to get to LaGuardia Airport, right? And to Kennedy Airport and to Newark Airport without having to take the Ubers or the long A trains and E trains. Yeah, so um, it looks like that uh, particular, uh, you know, project is actually the other big vision project of the governor. Uh, you know, we have been obviously less involved because it's not in our district, but it looks like the governor actually set his mind to redevelop uh, LaGuardia and do this uh, train system that is going to get into Jamaica and will not be a direct connection. So you will have to transfer at Jamaica and this is the governor's wish. Um, we may want to add some language, you know, to the effect that, you know, that this yet again, a lost opportunity, but it looked like uh, it was the path that was uh, chosen on that. Um, but, you know, so, certainly this is, uh, you know, this, this is more transit uh, driven. So, you know, maybe EJ, you have some thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, I think, I think there are a lot, there are a lot of proposals for more systemic improvements. Um, there, there's, and again, we don't know what's going to be in the master plan. It seems incredibly likely that it contains a connection to the gateway tunnels, which everyone you know knows are critical and and need to be built, and will eventually increase capacity across the Hudson. The idea of a of a single seat ride from the train stations to um, any particular airport has been a you know a, a dream of transit advocates for a very long time. It would itself need massive you know political backing by the governor he seems to have gone in right now with the idea of of an air train transfer um uh way out in in queens um to get you to laguardia the same way you transfer to an air train to get to jfk um for what it's worth uh george hikalis a member of the transportation committee has also talked about the proposal for a um uh a uh, tunnel connection between Penn Station and Grand Central. All of these things are are more broader systemic transit improve improvements that I think are probably outside even the scope of what will eventually be the Penn Station master plan. But I think to our part, we should be talking about you know what can what can how can we make sure that this that this development area is scoped such that as many of those things remain possibilities down the road as possible. Certainly moving the garden and enabling at least as many of the tracks as possible to be reconfigured and widened and eventually tied into other transit tunnels like Gateway or a connector or a single seat out to Long Island, that makes the probability of those things much, much greater, which I think we can, you know, we should emphasize when we when we argue for um, making sure that moving the garden is in scope and widening the tracks and widening the platforms um, that I think is within the realm of what we should be arguing for right now 
and we can talk about all those possibilities as part of the argument for it in this document without yeah. necessarily tying our own hands by calling for you know one specific uh, new transit improvement we want to we want to retain the universe of all of them and to you know to, to what Clayton was saying earlier I you know I I, I think Perhaps we absolutely could, you know, sh or should call for a call for a new park or call for new public space. I don't think we want to tie our hands by saying that one specific site should be used for it. You know, we should we should be creating the maximum universe of possibilities uh, for all of these improvements going forward. Yeah, Th thank you, EJ. Um, I see that Aaron has his hand up. Aaron, go ahead. Hi hey everyone. Um, so ju just to sort of second Clayton's comment, I, I definitely think that's a great idea about park space. I also think a couple other things, and, and to EJ's comment, you know, not to be too specific about where they should happen, but I think um, you know, when we talk about some capacity for community space, you know, how about a you know museum area dedicated to the history of the original Penn Station, some sort of um, you know tie in to the Historical Society of New York, right? Some, some area dedicated to education and community space. You know, having um, a, a meeting place for Community Board 5 to have some sort of auditorium space or some area that could be used for that. I think that's a great, you know, working compromise that, that we have some flexible space for the city slash community board specifically. Um, could be a great, way for you know community five to get more swing space to to host events you know we've had such gracious partners that allow us you know into their areas but you know we struggle to get a space where we could have a town hall type setting so so maybe a, a space like that has real value uh, of some kind but I, I do like the idea of having some historic connection to the history of penn station as well as you know maybe transit infrastructure in some way and i think there is a way to maybe do that in a very a very uh, you know conducive space in the overall uh, design. Yeah, and and I think that you know that nothing prevents us from you know dreaming big and asking for both a park, uh, which I think is there's a very very strong case to uh, to be made, as well as a community space. Um, I think we can have both you know a, a sort of like open recreational area and uh, a you know enclosed. Uh, you know, built uh, area um, to serve the, the needs of, uh, of our district and of our neighbors' uh, district. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, we, we need to make every possible effort to retain families in Manhattan. Uh, they are fleeing in a way that is absolutely troublesome and worrying, and uh, they are fleeing because they are concerned about the education of their children. And providing resources for uh, children, whether it is, you know, purely educational, you know, in, in a sort of more academic uh, sense or uh, recreational or, uh, you know, sports oriented is, uh, would be a, a, a tremendous benefit and would really help sustain um, the, you know, the, the, the steady presence of uh, our residential uh, component and, uh, and hopefully even its growth. Um, I see that uh, BJ has her hand up. Go ahead, BJ. Thank you again. Aaron, thank you for bringing the community aspect. Um, I want to tack on to what Aaron said. And, you know, uh, the nonprofit sector plays a, a huge role in the, uh, the vitality and health of our New York City. And, and you know, the nonprofit sector um, is a, a great partner to uh, have. And, and one of the things is to maybe work on some sort of like public benefit to offer incentives to nonprofits to open up their offices. You know, real estate has been so cost prohibitive for a lot of nonprofits to open up in Midtown. Well, downtown Wall Street has done a great job where there has been a couple of buildings where a lot of nonprofits moved out there because of the incentives what it was offering, right? So I think it'd be great if we could look at somehow inviting the nonprofit sector to partake in and be in this again because it's such a central location with ease of access and transportation and, and again, the many, many uh, resources that they could. Uh, uh, Offer to the community. So again, just saying that you know, nonprofits should have some sort of uh, uh, space in there uh, uh, to op open up their offices or some sort of facilities to help the community at large. Great. 
Very, very good point. Um, okay, I see that Sam has his hand up, and then I really want to open up the floor to uh, members of the uh, the public and um, attendees who have been uh, very patient. Uh, Sam, go ahead, and then I'll uh, open up to members of the public. Again, yeah, look, Leila, I, and I just wanted to reiterate, I think, what everybody else has been saying, but I want to remind everyone of the importance that, that not only do we need to think big, but we, we will need to hold firm. I think one of the things that we forget in scenarios like this <clears throat> is that whatever we're getting is of marginal cost compared to the profit of those who are seeing the real benefit from this. And I think we have to remember that, uh, that we are not the prime users of, of Penn Station. The people in our neighbourhood are not the commuters necessarily who are going to and from and getting the vast benefit of this. So I just want people to keep in mind that, that this is going to make a group of people a lot of money. And in return, we may get some upgrades to Penn Station. But I personally feel very strongly, given the history of the way that the politicians tend to bow down before the developers. We're the only hope of making sure that we do see a benefit and we do think big and, and that we, we really uh, dig in our heels and make it very, very clear that, that CB5 needs to profit in the same way that the commuters do, the users of Penn Station do, and also uh, the, the developers do because we've been left out many, many times in this process. That's it. Yeah, very, very, very good point. Totally agree. Um, I want to open up to uh, members of the public. So if you are um, in attendance, but you're not a board member, um, you can uh, use your uh, raise hand uh, button to speak. And then uh, once you recognize, Joseph would um, allow you to uh, join the conversation. And we will start with uh, Christine Berthe. Christine, you're recognized. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes, we can hear you, Christine. Okay. Thank you. Ter terrific meeting and comments. That's uh, very impressive. So I'm uh, the co-chair of Transportation Committee from CB4. And um, uh, I want to share with you some of the draft comments we have started to gather. We will have a meeting on Wednesday and you are all invited to participate if you want to, if you want to hear our comments. Um, you know, from a, uh, two things first, from the construction standpoint, construction impact, uh, the drop-in center for homeless, which is in CB5, is very is a very important resource to CB4 and CB5, and uh, we are very concerned of indeed it coming back. But also during the construction, they need to provide the resource and the facilities somewhere because it is being used intensively by uh, the whole neighborhood, including CB4. So I think this is something we need to. Put in the and the second thing is that there is a bus terminal on a parking lot which is on one of the uh, site one uh, a long distance bus and as you all know we have a lot of trouble with those stations the long distance and when they move that during the construction first of all after the construction i presume they would go to the new terminal at the bus terminal but during the construction and when there is not yet a, a new facility with a bus terminal, they'll continue the f location for that. And, and, and you know, uh, we are not excited to see it coming our way. <laughs> so I just want to say this is a construction issue. Um, many of the points you made about the conflict, the, 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 the fact that this construction is going to undermine uh, retail, I mean, first, I'm, with the, the state where retail is and the fact that they have never been able to really market all the retail space in the station, if they add all these retail spaces and they had the tornado and they add all this retail on the streets, how are they going to ever rent that? And how much of the rest of the retail in the neighborhoods going to cannibalize? 
So I'm, I'm concerned about that and the cannibalization of the other, uh, you know, real estate projects all around, as well as normal projects. Uh, very excited about your thoughts about Madison Square Garden. Um, we have talked a lot about, oh, residential building. We, we, I think we would like a lot that building which is at the corner of the site which is in CB4 to be a residential building because it is going to be on the block which is essentially residential. And so for neighborhood character and other reason, we think that this building would be, it would be a good location for making it a residential building. And, and certainly not a hotel. I mean, we have 10,000 uh, hotel rooms which have been created between 34 and 42nd, between eight and nine in the last 10 years. I mean, how many more hotel rooms do we need, right? So that's, that's for a thought. And we have a lot of comments about pedestrians and what they are studying for the, the surface transportation. There is no concept of where are the, the, the bicycle parking, where, is the, where are the bike share station, uh, how do we, you know, where do we put, if we put those things on the sidewalk, we don't have the space on the sidewalk for the pedestrians. So I think there's a whole infrastructure of bicycle which need to be thought through, not just the bike lanes but everything around that and essentially providing maybe a bike uh, depot you know when uh, the bike share companies have in some places bike depot where they accumulate them and then you can go and swap them i think one of those places where they wanted to put a parking would be perfect to put a huge bike depot so the bike share company can re-approvision uh, all the bike share stations so I, I don't think anybody is still thinking in terms of, you know, we need to do a study of the bike, of the bike infrastructure. And I think it's very important because it's, they are going to increase the capacity by 40%. So that's an important thing. And uh, as far as we have had a lot of uh, discussion in our board about deliveries and uh, garbage, and the fact that we want the buildings to really provide uh, loading docks for those two functions so that they are not uh, you know blocking the traffic and they are not blocking the pedestrians so making sure that the whole garbage in every building and for every retail store is going to be inside the buildings and making sure that for the deliveries they have uh, they have loading docks and they don't need people, you know, double parking, especially because there are so many deliveries now. So that whole delivery concept need to be rethought. And since they are going to put so much concentration in such a small space, and it's going to conflict with the, you know, the commuters, which are going to be intense, I think we need to be very prescriptive about the way the, the, the parking lane and the, the sidewalk perform. Uh, for example, we want to see probably a lot of trees, you know, because it's nice, but if you put a lot of trees, you have to remove that from the capacity available for pedestrians. And uh, also all these, uh, you know, anti-terrorism bollards, which are t taking you know, capacity from everyone. Uh, so what we have around the Madison Square Garden is just horrible. You have to man navigate around those bollards and you don't have the space necessary. So we're going to speak a lot to all those things. And I encourage you to, to also raise it because it's, it's a lot, when you start to have that such tall buildings, it's a lot of conflict. Yeah, very, very, very good point, and uh, I, I think we all totally agree that uh, you know the uh, the ad grade um, uh, redevelopment. Uh, I think this is probably the area that holds uh, most promise in this proposal. You know, if if we get it right, we can really improve things, but. Uh, it has to be properly uh, studied now and, you know, make sure that the scope is, is you know, correctly defined 
uh, including you know all all the, that you said about you know uh, bike use, uh, you know bike infrastructure being you know fully developed uh, so that it it, it works, um, and some sort of so that may, maybe we want to uh, to consider that you know the scope of area be broader than strictly the uh, uh, the, the development zone uh, because you know pedestrians uh, in essence you know they move. <laughs> They're not right. Good. Right. The other thing is that the taxi the taxi queues are a big deal. I mean, you know, you know that on Seventh Avenue, on Ninth, on on Eighth Avenue, it's really a mess. Yeah. And, um, we are very much in favor of shared streets, but I've always hoped that 33rd, a portion of 33rd Street could be used for, um, for taxis. So I'm just putting that out. I mean, I'm very much in favor of shared street, but there are a lot of competing demand just in that area. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think those, those points are, are very valid. Uh, we very much look forward to uh, working with you and with Community Board 4. Um, and uh, thank you for sharing the uh, information about your upcoming meeting. And uh, I encourage all the uh, members of CB5 to, uh, to actually join and attend. I assume that we can find uh, the uh, information on, on the website of CB4. Yes, we, we'll send it to you. I think we send it to... Um... Uh, to uh, your district manager Wally, but we will make sure it does go there again. Great, perfect. Really appreciate it. Um, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, thank you, Christine. Um, I just want to second from a from a uh, peer transportation committee perspective. I want to second a lot of of what Christine said, and, it, and certainly certainly smart thinking. You know, something that perhaps we should we should stress even more, Layla, is. Whereas this scoping seems to call out certain sidewalks for widening and, you know, certain limited areas for creating more pedestrian space or say city bike space. Perhaps we want to say that the scope should really as transformatively as possible think about ways to actually increase in a holistic way the pedestrian flow of the area. There are these development sites that are presented to us like site four and site five, which are, you know, very, very short buildings right now that were probably targeted because of the dramatic um, increase in, in floor space that they could get from a larger building. But th there's tremendous choke points and pedestrians just like on the street during rush hour when you're talking about 8th Avenue and 7th Avenue on those specific stretches and we we may want to say that that shouldn't just be transformed into a sheer you know it, it should be as it should be assessed from the perspective of how can those pedestrian th thoroughfares be be improved as well from a more holistic uh a viewpoint by thinking about the whole the whole avenue yeah yeah and i i, I think that you know asking for a extended boundaries on those aspects makes sense uh because you know the the pedestrian mass starts way before you know it starts uh, uh i mean 28th street and 29 and you know the, the stretch of 7th avenue on you know along uh, 28 and 29 is very congested and so is you know the stretch north uh, of uh, 34th. So I think it would make sense to recommend that these areas are included in the, in the scope. Um, I see that uh, someone... Oh, sorry, Leila, I just want to chime in real quick. Uh, we have a few people calling in. Um, so I just want to let you know that if, you would, if you're calling in from a phone and you would like to speak, uh, you can press star nine on your keypad and that'll raise your hand. Um, and then for those of you that are not calling in, um, if you can't find the raise your hand button, if you go to the bottom of your screen, and click on participants, it'll bring up a button that says raise hand. So if you'd like to speak, you can raise your hand that way. Great, thank you, Joseph. I see that someone uh, named CN um, has their hand up. So CN, you are recognized. And uh, as soon as uh, you're permitted, you can go ahead and speak. And if you can, if you can uh, state your name, that would be great. And you are recognized. Can you hear? Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, wonderful. Um, so, um, there are some audio. Uh, can you can sorry. You, can you state your name? Oh, sorry. Uh, yes, C N. 
Okay. Yes. So um, um, in the city, there are some audio pedestrian signals which uh, let blind people and visually impaired people know what street they're about to cross and if it's safe for them to cross. And around the Penn Station, uh, there are a few pedestrian signals on uh, 8th Avenue between 31st and 32nd Street. And I believe on 34th um, near uh, outside of Macy's and, um, and one on 7th Avenue. I'm, I'm wondering if uh, when this development starts and um, if construction results in those uh, pedestrian signals being removed, will they be reinstalled? Also, I'm wondering um, with, uh, with this construction maybe uh, resulting in the streets being dug up, um, maybe this is a great opportunity for the uh, Department of Transportation uh, who install these uh, signals to install more of them because uh, they, um, they can be uh, very costly at times to install because sometimes, uh, you know, um, there needs to be permits to dig up the street. And, um, you know, so I was wondering about that and uh, maybe the developers could install some more of these signals because there's not nearly enough uh, audio pedestrian signals in the city. Also, I was wondering regarding if the streets would be pedestrianized and uh, closed off to traffic. Um, I'm wondering if uh, maybe there could be a way to look into some sort of tactile guide. Um, uh, just very quickly, I'll, I'll tell you, uh, I was able to experience a tactile type of guide in- um, You really need really to stick to questions. Yes, I apologize. So, um, um, well, I'm just wondering if there's some sort of uh, way of tactiling a path to help people who are blind and visually impaired in the pedestrian uh, sort of plaza areas if there was one to be made because it's very difficult for someone who's blind or visually impaired to navigate in um, those crowded areas. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, th thank, thank you so much. So definitely we can make a recommendation that uh, the, uh, the ADA, uh, you know, the, the accessibility be uh, thoroughly evaluated um, so that, uh, you know, it, it takes into consideration all these aspects that you, that, that you have just raised, um, you know, so that at the time that we get the opportunity to comment on the proposal itself, we can make those recommendations and advocate for those, um, you know, in, in a way that we would not be told that, you know, it is not within the, the scope. So th those are very good points that uh, we can we can add in our uh, scoping recommendations. Um, uh, for members of the public, I see that uh, Betty McIntosh um, has her hand up and Betty, you are recognized. Unmute. Yes, you hear me now? Yes, we can. Yeah, okay, thank you. I'm co-chair of the Chelsea Land Use Committee of Community Board 4. I first want to say, great, you guys are so thoughtful and thorough, and um, we're very impressed. So you're making our life much better. Uh, <laughs> And I wanted to call out a few things that uh, we've discovered in reading the uh, draft scope. Um, on, there's a table on page 15 that at first I didn't notice it, but in the footnotes, there's an alternative for site four, which is 630 dwelling units. So uh, you just need to, to know that. And uh, echoing what Christine wrote, talked about uh, site one being for residential buildings. Any residential buildings were very adamant that there be a percent of affordable housing. Community Board 4 is really, really uh, keen on providing affordable housing. Um, you may have noticed that uh, there are 400 parking spaces that are a total in that table. And uh, one might ask if that makes sense, because this is such a major uh, transit hub, does 400 parking spaces make sense? Um, and the applicant hasn't decided if those are to be for the public or just private yet. So that's another issue to think about. Uh, and looking at the sites, I walked it this morning, 
that there are a couple of parking lots that are open to the public now, so they would be demolished. And so that's something to think about. The idea of the park open space, yes, 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 we have a deficit of park open space in community district four that would be wonderful in terms of community benefits we uh did a study a year or two ago about health facilities and we have a deficit of health facilities so that may be something you want to focus on and um i think the open space analysis definitely needs to take into consideration uh new dwelling units both the actual number that's in the uh, chart on page 15, 630, plus whatever alternative, alternative ideas we have, say in one or two sites. So um, I think that you've covered, and you've covered many, many great topics. So I'll stop there for now, and uh, we hope that you can also see our discussion next, when, this coming Wednesday night. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you so much for bringing this um, alternate uh, uh, possible development in the, in the notes uh, that definitely had uh, escaped me. Um, so that's interesting because if indeed they are considering a alternate proposal with uh, residential development, then uh, they do need to uh, study, you know, impact on schools and uh, uh, other uh, community facilities. Um, so we certainly so need to that in, the, uh, in our uh, scoping comments. Um, certainly, you know, the uh, uh, health facilities, uh, I think there's a, there's a big deficit of, uh, of those in uh, CB5 as well. So I think we would uh, definitely uh, support, you know, looking into that. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, as, as we said, we really look forward to uh, working with CB4. Um, you know, we're, we're in this together. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there's definitely a uh, strength in, in number, so uh, we'll uh, make. Uh, I will certainly attend the uh, the meeting, and I'm urging oh, the uh, CB5 mm -hmm. members to uh, to do the same. Um, any other members of the public uh, have uh, any questions or comments uh, to this uh, scoping document? Okay, so seeing none, uh, I'm coming back to the panelists and I see that uh, July has her hand up. July, go ahead. Thank you, Leila. Um, I just wanna add, um, many people had many excellent points and I'm so grateful that I participated tonight um, in this meeting and two more points that I would like to add. Uh, one, in terms of public benefits, um, Certainly open space, um, community facility, meeting space, school, uh, study for school seats. Um, but I'm wondering if uh, in addition, we wanna do a concept of uh, revenue sharing with the future owners of these building, buildings. Um, the draft scope calls for approximately 20 million square feet of new space, buildings. If we took one cent from one square foot of their future annual revenue, that would be $200,000 per year for the community to use, whether that's providing computers for the schools, um, homeless services for the homeless population. The community, um, of course, will have to set up a proper uh, process and procedures. Um, will have a say according to our perhaps annual budget priorities. Um, so that's one thought. Um, and perhaps it should be a percentage rather than a dollar cent amount because the revenues will increase over years. Um, thought number two, um, I went on a tour to Hudson Yards, this was back in 2017 when they were under construction and uh, related uh, was the main uh, entity um, and somebody from related explained when they were designing the whole Hudson Yards development they thought whenever uh, you needed to fix something add a pipe a wire in the city you need to dig up the street and that inevitably created traffic congestion 
um, so they made the street surfaces um, accessible um, without having, you know, digging up the surface of the streets. So I think that's something we should very reasonably ask for this project to include. I'm not sure if that's the stage to request that, but certainly that will minimize the traffic and pedestrian congestion down the road. Um, I, I actually did not know that those types of uh, street surfacing uh, existed. That's really interesting. Uh, definitely, this is something that we can uh, recommend. I don't know that it is really uh, within the scoping period that we should be doing that, but you know, hold on to that thought so that you know, when time comes to uh, you know make recommendations on the project itself, uh, we make sure to uh, to advocate for that. Um, the comment that you made on, uh, you know, like sort of like levying a tax on um, those uh, additional uh, FAR that are, that are going to be created, I think it's very interesting. Uh, once again, I don't know that it is necessarily within the scope period. I think that, you know, it's, it would be in a way sort of like similar to the, uh, to the uh, governing fund um, that was created as part of uh, East Midtown. Um, and then, you know, we would have to determine, you know, who gets those funds, who administers those funds, and how do they get uh, spent, you know, allocated to what kind of project and, uh, you know, who would have authority and, uh, you know, any review on, on how that is, uh, that, that is being done. Um, but, you know, it is something that exists in East Midtown. It also exists in the, um, the theater subdistrict. Uh, where you know there's a contribution that is made to a fund, and then those funds are being used uh, for uh, the, uh, the the theater operators. Um, so you know, definitely something to uh, to keep in mind. Once again, I don't know that it is part of the scoping um, because really, you know, right now we're you know defining the the perimeter of what we believe is uh, correct to assess. Uh, but you know, hold on to that thought so that uh, when the time comes to make those uh, those recommendations on you know the merits of the the project itself, uh, we can we can get back to that. And you know, once again, I want to say to everyone, uh, we should think big and we should uh, consider that you know we're entitled to more than one uh, you know, possible benefit. You know, it's not because we get a part that we have to. You know, uh, give up uh, everything else. Um, so, you know, we need to keep that in mind and, uh, you know, keep thinking, keep being creative so that, uh, you know, once again, the goal is at some point to be able to say, well, yeah, actually we like this project and we can support it. Um, that, that's the goal. The goal is not to say that we don't like it. The goal is really to, you know, find ways to shape it, be involved and, you know, work with the, uh, the, the different parties so that it becomes a, a project that CB5 uh, and, you know, our colleagues of CB4 uh, consider you know, to be a good project that we can support. Um, are there any other uh, comments or questions before uh, we go to wrapping up this very long meeting? Layla, I'm not sure. I don't remember anyone mentioning um, Macy's and any proposed development on the block to the north, but should we discuss perhaps that being potentially part of the expanded scoping? Um, so you know, when, once again, I I don't uh, I don't feel super comfortable making recommendations when uh, you know for a particular uh, party when the party is not in the room. Um, we have not heard that Macy's wants to be included in this development. In my opinion, it would make sense if they are going to redevelop their site. Um, that, you know, it would be done in a comprehensive fashion uh, rather than, you know, a more piecemeal, almost like spot zoning type of, uh, of approach. Um, so, you know, maybe this is something that we want to raise as, you know, we want to make sure that uh, the, the uh, environmental study is done in a comprehensive way that also includes other projects that may be happening simultaneously. Uh, but I don't know that we necessarily want to say that, you know, this is what we uh, feel is appropriate, given that, you know, Macy's has not expressed that and is not in the room to say whether, you know, they, they think it's a good idea or not. 
D does that, that make sense? That absolutely makes sense. Um, maybe perhaps we would frame it specifically by saying that um, we do think it makes sense to also consider at the same time blocks across 34th Street so that the, the whole of the connectedness and um, transit capacity of 34th Street is part of the consideration and adjacent blocks is part of the consideration as well. Yeah, yeah, I, th I think that that makes sense. And certainly the data being used should include, uh, you know, the uh, potential redevelopment of, uh, of Macy's. Um, I think it's, uh, it, it, it makes sense. Uh, Clayton, go ahead. Well, just on this point, it makes me realize that I, if there's a way to call into scope the gimbal, the historic gimbals underpass connecting these points underground in these blocks, if that is something that we would want to, you know, require being restored and reopened to the public as part of any future transit improvements. Yeah, yeah, ab absolutely. Uh, we should we should add that to uh, to to our recommendation. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, okay. So, um, are there any other uh, thoughts, uh, considerations that um, the uh, both committees feel should be added uh, to to our uh, recommendation, uh, Chris? Uh, I'm not sure if this is appropriate for the community benefits section or the public benefits section. Um, but if it's not already our plan, I would like to add something in about new affordable housing. I understand that that might fall into the section that addresses residential displacement. So I'm not sure where the piece is, but I think that we should be um, trying to get some look at the possibility of adding more affordable housing, given the effect that this will have on the neighborhood. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I, I think that, you know, it, we, we've heard from CB4 that, you know, it, it is a, a concern of theirs. I think that, you know, CB5 is on record uh, saying that, you know, we're probably the district that has the least affordable housing, which is really a shame. And, uh, you know, this, this uh, development is a great opportunity and this is something that definitely should be, uh, should be considered. Uh, both in CB4 and we support uh, our, our neighbors on, on their advocacy, but also in CB5. Totally, I think it's it's totally fair, and therefore, you know, the the whole residential component should be uh, evaluated and part of the scope. Um, yeah. Okay. Any other uh, thoughts, comments? Okay. So, seeing none, uh, another question for your consideration: Are there any objections to any of the comments that were made, and that basically, if there's no objection? All the comments that we made tonight will be incorporated into a lengthy resolution that will serve as the basis for preparing our, our uh, testimony for the hearing on uh, July 20th. Are there any uh, you know, areas of concern that we have underlined that you have you know, strong objection to? Okay, so seeing none, I think that we're ready to uh, wrap up uh, this, uh, this meeting. Uh, so we need a motion. Um, and uh, I think the motion could be something as uh, simple as, you know, uh, I move to uh, approve all the recommendations that were made uh, previously during, during the course of the meeting. This meeting is recorded, so, you know, it, it will serve as uh, our minute and, you know, the resolution will basically be, you know, the sort of like written version of, uh, of, of those minutes. Um, I cannot make the motion because I'm the chair and EJ cannot make the motion because he's the chair. So we need uh, someone to make a motion. Clayton, I'm looking at you. <laughs> Clayton, go ahead. Happy to make a motion to uh, approve this, this resolution given all the topics that we discussed over the prior two hours and 51 minutes, all of which are on the public record. I second. Fantastic. All right, so uh, in order to do this the proper way, we're going to take this to a vote. Uh, so in a vote yes is in favor of the motion. Um, I'm going to take the, uh, the vote for uh, land use, uh, starting with uh, Dave Achalis. Yes. Uh, Nick. Yes. Uh, Andreas. I don't think Andreas is uh, Julie. Yes. Aaron. Yes. I don't think Nancy is with us. Uh, Mike? Yes. Uh, Tristan? Aaron said yes. yes. I don't know, if, just in case you missed it. 
Aaron uh, Ford said yes. Yes, I got that. Yes. Yes, thank you. Um, Tristan. Yes. Uh, EJ. You you get you get to vote on on the land use portion. <laughs> I'm sorry. <Yes. laughs> um, John Raybar. Yes. Um, Clayton. Yes. Rachel. Yes. Ryan. I don't think Ryan is with us. Did I miss anyone from the land use committee? No, I got everybody and myself, I'm a yes. Okay, so the motion is uh, unanimous uh, on land use. And uh, EJ, uh, if you want to take the uh, vote on uh, t and &E. We will now do t and &E. um, Behor. Yes. Clark. Yes. Is Dale still with us? No. Goldman. Yes. Hartman. Yes. Levy. Yes. Lusick. Yes. Pawson. Yes. Raybar. Yes. Is Noah still with us? Noah Stern. No. Uh, BJ. Yes. Schinkel. He's not here. Webb. Uh, I'm going to vote present, not entitled, based upon the what we talked about earlier, EJ. Yep, thank you. We do not have Waylon. We do not have Hycalis. No, Hugo. No. Uh, Maxman. No. And I am a yes. So it's unanimous with one present not entitled. All right, fantastic. Um, EJ and I will be in touch uh, to uh, start drafting the, uh, the resolution. Um, so, uh, you know, be, uh, ch check your emails. You may have a little writing assignment. And uh, on that note, um, we will adjourn the meeting. Thank you so much for your participation and uh, keep thinking about it because it's gonna keep us busy for um, you know, the next year or two. Thank you so much, guys. Meeting adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thanks, uh, thanks, Good night. Thank you.